R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 1, Chapters 12 through 16. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 12, Five Drab Years End in Opportunity. His record at St. Louis entitled Robert E. Lee to a good assignment on his arrival in Washington, October 22, 1840, and he doubtless would have received it at once, but for the fact that the very conditions that had forced him to leave the West, namely, the lack of government appropriations, prevailed equally in the East. The Treasury was almost empty, federal finances were in chaos. There was talk of a loan to meet current obligations. No construction was in progress except on the coast defenses, which Colonel Totten was anxious to complete speedily. Most of this work was under engineers whom it was not expedient to transfer. Nothing better could be given Lee, therefore, after a month in Washington, than a tour of inspection of three of the forts in the Carolinas, where the constant pounding of the waves was damaging the works or the breakwaters designed to protect them. The first of the three to be visited by Lee was Fort Macon, situated close to Beaufort, Carteret County, N.C., and designed to cover one of the entrances to the Sound that extends, under various names, along nearly the whole of the coastline of that state. Fort Macon was being built when Lee graduated from West Point, and it had received its garrison while he was working under Gresham at Washington. The site had been continuously subject to encroachment by the sea, and during flood tides, a part of it was overflowed. Examination in 1840 had indicated that strong jetties were necessary on the seaside and that a dike would be required to halt the overflow. Various repairs were needed, also, on leaky casemates, etc. Lee went to Beaufort about November 7, 1840, and made a close examination of the fort. This convinced him that it needed more protection from the battering Atlantic, and he set about devising a method for providing this. From Beaufort, it is likely that Lee went southwestward along the coast for about 100 miles to the mouth of the Cape Fear River. There he was to make a similar inspection of the breakwaters at Fort Caswell, which had been virtually completed in 1834, but had been injured by the sea the very next year. Sundry repairs and improvements, subsequently made, had not altogether served their purpose. A further small appropriation for additions to the dikes had been authorized but had not become available at the time Lee planned to go there. The site of the fort was interesting. It stood on a point of land known as Oak Island, projecting eastward from the mainland and overlooking the channel, which was entered from the south. Across the channel from Oak Island was Smith's Island, on the southern end of which was Cape Fear. Above Fort Caswell and Smith's Island was the long, wide mouth of the Cape Fear River, leading up to Washington. On a narrow spit between the river and the sea was ground that must have appealed to Lee's eye as an ideal location for a fortification to defend the stream. The time was to come when that site on the eastern spit was to figure much in Lee's mind, for there was to be located Fort Fisher, guardian of the Southern Confederacy's last open port on the Atlantic. If Lee reached Fort Caswell, he had scarcely begun his investigation there when the time came to go home for Christmas. After the holidays, he drew up his reports on Fort Macon, covering both the repair of the fort and the extension of the jetties. It was March 20 before the last of the drawings to accompany the reports and estimates had been finished. By that time, an alternative assignment was open, and Lee had a choice of going to New York Harbor or returning soon to North Carolina to supervise the improvements on the two forts there. He had not been particularly happy in Carolina, and for that reason alone he doubtless would have elected to go to New York. In a larger sense, there was no comparison between the two posts. Both would involve much routine, but the Carolina forts were of relatively little importance at the time, whereas the works in New York Harbor were the most vital of the country's coast defenses. Lee quickly decided for New York, but he did not escape all responsibility for Fort Macon, and, until June 14, 1842, he likewise remained in official charge of the St. Louis improvements. Reaching New York on the night of April 10, 1841, in a period of very bad weather, Lee soon discovered that his task was not as interesting as he had hoped it would be, that it was laborious but technically not difficult. His instructions were to institute somewhat elaborate repairs at Fort Lafayette and to make various changes in Fort Hamilton, particularly in the parapet, so as to adapt it to barbette guns.
Both these forts were at the Narrows, between the upper and the lower bays of New York Harbor. Fort Hamilton was on the Brooklyn side, in a somewhat inaccessible location, with Fort Lafayette almost directly under its shadow, though separated from it by a channel. Before he had been in New York a week, Lee received instructions to take over, in addition, batteries Hudson and Morton, two fortifications formerly under state control on Staten Island, that were to be modernized and rearmed. For projects were thus under his superintendence, on either side of the Narrows and in it. Fort Hamilton had been completed in 1831 and had been a source of much pride at that time to the Engineering Corps, but it had lacked some essentials even then, and after ten years its condition was bad. Its casemates were damp and leaking. The seawall had yielded in places to the pounding of the surf. Fort Lafayette was also in ill repair, and part of it had virtually to be rebuilt. As no drawings of this fort could be found either at Governor's Island or in the Chief Engineer's office in Washington, Lee had to spend a good part of the summer of 1841 in making measurements and in preparing a full set of tracings. Because the work at New York gave every promise of extending over a term of years, Lee brought his family to Fort Hamilton a month or so after he was ordered there. He established his wife and children in a house the government had acquired along with the site of Fort Hamilton, though the premises were in so wretched a condition that they had to be renovated before they were habitable. The young Lees, who descended on the fort, now numbered five, for the new baby was of course brought along with the rest. She had been named Eleanor Agnes, but the Eleanor was dropped early and she was always known as Agnes. Into his new duties Lee threw himself with the same energy he had displayed at St. Louis. Employing a little boat known as the Flash, he regularly visited the four forts under repair and in a short time he was able to get results at each place. Much of the bookkeeping and virtually all the engineering he had to do in person, for he had only one clerk for the whole enterprise and only one foreman at each fort. It was not until late in September that he felt justified in employing a draftsman to copy the drawings he had personally made of Fort Lafayette. Diligent as Lee was, the routine soon became deadening. The old sense of frustration besieged him. Days were so crowded with a multiple of construction details that he had little opportunity for correspondence. The high-spirited letters to McKay and to Talcott became less frequent. Those that he wrote show youth vanishing and life becoming that of a hard-worked superintendent of indifferent labor. He seemed to be weighted down by the very stones of the forts. During that first summer he left his station only twice, once to visit the Connecticut quarries from which he was getting stone and once to confer in Washington with Colonel Totten. Before the end of August, 1841, the repairs were so much advanced that the War Department ordered troops to Fort Hamilton and to Fort Lafayette. The latter work was still much lumbered and gave the soldiers little room even when the mechanics who had previously been housed there were moved, at no little inconvenience, to the mainland. Lee himself had to vacate the home his family was using. He would have preferred, of course, that the garrisoning of the places had been delayed, but after twelve years in the army he made the best of what he could not prevent and might not change. Having no quarters, he rented a house at $300 a year from James C. Church, having previously received the consent of the chief engineer. With the hardest of effort, Lee completed by September 30 the greater part of the work then planned for Fort Hamilton. He closed the open embrasures in the parapet wall, raised the wall, and prepared the terraplane for 23 guns. To find sufficient space for this number of guns he had to extend the terraplane seven feet into the parapets of the northwestern and southeastern faces of the fort. He also stopped the leaks in the casemates on the waterfront and renewed the floor and ceiling of the magazines. Meantime the drawings of Fort Lafayette had been completed, the trusses of the second floor of that fort had been placed, materials for the construction of the other trusses and for paving one of the batteries had been assembled, and progress had been made in preparing the Barbette battery for its armament. Battery Hudson and Battery Morton were completed except for the construction of a few magazines. Lee was much interested in Battery Hudson and believed that it would prove more powerful in the defense of the passage than any other at the Narrows. He reasoned that it would afford the first fire on an approaching enemy whom it would force within range of Fort Hamilton and Fort Lafayette. The extension of this battery Lee urged in strong terms on the War Department. Fifty guns, he said, ought to be put into the battery. Work continued on a diminished scale until January, 1842, and in March was resumed at all the forts.
shot furnaces were provided for batteries Hudson and Morton, and the former was extended, as Lee had suggested, with provision for 13 additional guns. Lee took up also an appeal that Colonel Totten had previously made for the acquisition of Fort Tompkins, which completely dominated batteries Hudson and Morton. Having reduced these batteries, the enemy might be able to pass his ships up the Narrows, undisturbed by the fortifications on the opposite side. The chief engineer repeated this plea in his next annual report, but he could not prevail upon Congress to act. All he could do at the time was to have Lee prepare a drawing of Fort Tompkins. The War Department, however, did not let the matter end here. The Bureau of Engineers was working under a well-considered plan of completing and maintaining a new system of fortifications and of putting into condition for service such of the old works as could not be speedily superseded. The improvements Lee urged were an essential part of this plan. The work at Fort Hamilton and Fort Lafayette during 1842 consisted of a long list of repairs and minor improvements. They were not very difficult, though they called for close supervision. Not a little ingenuity had to be employed, also, in effecting some of the changes. Lee pressed all this as rapidly as he could, in the face of general orders from the chief engineer to reduce expenditures. By fall, he had Fort Lafayette in good condition and was satisfied with the waterfront at Fort Hamilton. On the land fronts, he saw much that needed to be done. He kept at the task all summer, with apparently only one absence. That was in April, when he went to Washington and reconciled the accounts of his St. Louis work with those of the bank, prior to turning over that enterprise to John W. Russell. No work being practicable at the Narrows during the winter of 1842-1843, Lee and his family spent that time at Arlington, but by March, 1843, he was back in New York, pushing the repairs as fast as he could in view of Congress's delay in making appropriations. Mrs. Lee and the children returned to New York with him, but journeyed homeward again in the early autumn in order that the sixth baby might be born under its grandparents' roof. The young gentleman made his appearance on October 27, 1843, and was named Robert Edward. He has a fine long nose like his father, but no whiskers, Lee reported to his friend Kaiser, in St. Louis. Together with Major J. S. Smith and Captain Henry Brewerton, Lee was sent to West Point during the summer to report on the best location and suitable dimensions of proposed new cadet barracks. That pleasant break in the regular course of duty gave Lee his first close view of the changes that had been made at the academy since his own cadet days. The routine repair work of the year, painting and mounting guns at Fort Lafayette, restoring the advanced redoubt, raising walls, paving floors, and waterproofing at Fort Hamilton, was again interrupted, and not so pleasantly, on August 22, by a storm of unparalleled violence that caused several of the slopes at the forts to slide or to collapse. In asking for the authority to repair this damage, Lee urged that the slopes be reduced and that they be resodded. Despite a regime of economy that had called for a curtailment of work in July, these changes had to be approved by the Bureau, though the execution of some of them was of necessity deferred until the next season. Part of the winter of 1843-1844 was spent in Washington and at Arlington on the unromantic task of verifying and tabulating the government's titles to the lands occupied by the public defenses. Lee came to the capital after January 10, 1844, and on April 15 was ordered back to Fort Hamilton. The construction during the season that followed was the simplest and the easiest Lee had directed since he had been assigned to the Narrows. Batteries Hudson and Morton were fenced in and put in condition for service, except for mounting the guns. At Fort Lafayette nothing had to be done except to point up certain masonry and to undertake some painting. At Fort Hamilton work on the slopes was completed, and some decayed woodwork and furring were pulled out and replaced. That was all. And a drab labor it was for a man whose whole impulse was to action. For the first time in many summers Lee had a little leisure, which the vigilant chief engineer employed in the public service and to Lee's own gratification by naming him one of the officers to attend the final examinations at West Point in June, 1844. The Board of Visitors had been abolished in 1843 and special commissions of prominent men from the army, named by the president, acted in its stead. This assignment lasted more than two weeks, during which time most of the visiting soldiers lodged together, ate together, and became well acquainted with one another.
On the board, which convened that year on June 10, were Lee's old cadet commandant, Major W. J. Worth, now brevet brigadier general, much honored for his conduct of the Seminole campaign, a capable young captain of artillery, Erasmus D. Keyes, whom Lee learned to admire very highly, and above all, physically and in the vigor of his personality, Major General Winfield Scott, who had become the commanding general of the army on the death, two years before, of General Macomb. This period of association with old fuss and feathers, as he later became known, was a major event in the life of the tired, frustrated engineer. Lee doubtless had met Scott many times in Washington, for the general essayed to be a lion in the society of the capital, where Lee himself was not averse to bowing. The fortnight at West Point, however, was the first time the two ever sat down to a common task, where the intelligence and judgment of each was displayed at its real value, regardless of the differences in their military rank. Lee must have made a very deep impression on Scott, whose influence and good opinion were to become among the strongest forces in Lee's career. Lee did not win Scott's esteem, however, by any sort of sycophancy. On the contrary, Lee nominated and procured the appointment of Captain Keyes as instructor of artillery and cavalry, in the face of Scott's open advocacy of another man. Keyes was enduringly grateful, and even when he was leading a division against Lee's army, eighteen years thereafter, he had not forgotten the former kindness of his antagonist. The two had many frank talks on questions of the day, as they watched the ordeal of the cadets that summer of 1844. Lee meantime was making other northern friends at his own station among the garrison officers. John Sedgwick of Connecticut, a West Pointer of the class of 1837, had been on duty at Fort Hamilton as an artillerist in 1842-1843 and had become one of Lee's stoutest admirers, though destined to fall in Spotsylvania County May 10, 1864, before the rifle of one of his sharpshooters. Still another young soldier who became attached to Lee at this period was a man of high promise, then a second lieutenant of artillery at Fort Hamilton, Henry J. Hunt by name. Lee was then, in Hunt's eyes, as fine-looking a man as one would wish to see, of perfect figure and strikingly handsome. Quiet and dignified in manner, of cheerful disposition, always pleasant and considerate, he seemed to me the perfect type of a gentleman. Lee and Hunt found a ground of friendly understanding in the controversy that shook St. John's, the little garrison church at Fort Hamilton, of which Lee was a vestryman, though he was not then a communicant. The Episcopalians at the fort were much divided in their view of Puseyism, the high church theology of the day, promulgated at Oxford by Edward Bouverie Pusey. As Lee was reticent during the time the discussion rose to an excited climax, every effort was made to trap him into a declaration, pro or con, on high church and the real presence in the Eucharist. Lee became amused at the feline character of the controversy. On a certain evening, when the argument was very catty, one of the disputants went even further than usual in trying to draw him into the debate. Lee turned to Lieutenant Hunt, with much assumed gravity, I am glad, said he, to see that you keep aloof from the dispute that is disturbing our little parish. That is right, and we must not get mixed up in it, we must support each other in that. But I must give you some advice about it, in order that we may understand each other, beware of pussyism. Pussyism is always bad, and may lead to unchristian feeling, therefore beware of pussyism. His warning and his inflection sharpened the point of his little pun, there was less discussion of pussyism around the post and less pussyism. Lee's own views were never revealed to the curious amateur theologians of Fort Hamilton. He was, however, in practice and in faith, definitely low church all his life. With the approach of cold weather in the late months of 1844, Colonel Totten, the chief engineer, ordered Lee to Washington to act once more as office assistant. It was, of course, pleasant to Lee to get back to Arlington with his family and no less pleasant to escape a winter of tempests in the harbor of New York. It was a thrifty arrangement, also, from the standpoint of Colonel Totten, for it helped him to utilize the slack season of at least two of his assistants. During the winter he could employ Lee in the office, and when it was warm enough for Lee to begin operations in New York it was beginning to get too torrid on the Gulf of Mexico for efficient work there. Totten accordingly could summon from Mobile a brilliant young lieutenant named George L. Welker to take up the duties Lee laid down. 
Li went to Washington about December 22, 1844, in time for the family to have Christmas at Arlington, but he soon found that the work assigned him under Colonel Totten's economical arrangement was much the same as that in which General Gratiot had first schooled him in the dark, restless months of 1834-1835. Lee wrote wearily of it to his old friend, Jack McKay, could you see my list of correspondents among Whigs, Democrats, congressmen and officers, you would, not, wonder at my horror at the sight of pen, ink and paper, and with what perfect disgust I pick up my hat between 4 and 5 p.m. with the firm determination of doing nothing until the next morning, except to go home, eat my dinner, play with the little Lees, and rest. At eight next morning I am again in the saddle to go through the same routine. It was so grim a battle with officialdom that Lee could not have been sorry when orders came on March 31, 1845, to return to Fort Hamilton. But his labors at the Narrows during the season of 1845 constituted, if possible, as dull a routine as that at engineering headquarters. No new work was undertaken at batteries Hudson and Morton. Only a few guns had to be mounted at Fort Lafayette. The renovation of the magazines was deferred because of the possibility they might be needed in case of war with England over Oregon or with Mexico over Texas. Even at Fort Hamilton, where some trouble arose with the contractor regarding the delivery of stone, nothing more exciting had to be done than to repair quarters, cut two posterns, excavate a ditch through the covert way, and the like. The grey round of this uninteresting life was brightened somewhat in September, 1845, by an appointment as a member of the Board of Engineers for the Atlantic Coast Defences. This honour came to Lee in part because he had the leisure for the duties, and in part because of his general attainments as an engineer. His special knowledge of New York Harbour made him a particularly desirable member of the board at a time when it was to make a special analysis of the fortification of that port, the improvement of which the Secretary of War regarded as the work most needed for the better defense of the country. Without being relieved of his assignment at the Narrows, Lee was to join with his brother officers of the board in studying the best method of fortifying Sandy Hook, in examining the entire defensive system of New York, and in forming a project for occupying the site of Old Forts Tompkins and Richmond. The board was, in addition, to extend a reconnaissance over all the country which an enemy must cross in making an attack by land, and to indicate in a full report the position and nature of such land defenses, if any, as it would be desirable to erect in time of war. This was a fascinating assignment, and the more so as it meant association with some of the best men of the Corps of Engineers, Colonel Thayer, Lee's old superintendent at West Point, Major John Lynn Smith, a senior in the service, and Major Richard Delafield, who had just been relieved as head of the military academy. Lee, as the junior officer, was made recording officer of the board, and, as it pursued its study, he filed frequent reports of its proceedings, which, of course, were confidential in character. While his part in the deliberations probably was not predominant, it added to his equipment as an engineer. At Fort Pulaski, at Fort Monroe, and at the Narrows, he had learned to build to repair forts. Now he was to study how to locate them. The winter of 1845-1846 was the one period of Lee's service at Fort Hamilton, above all others, when he would most have wished, for personal reasons, to be at Arlington. Custis, who is now thirteen, was sent back to Virginia for his schooling. Mrs. Lee was pregnant again and wanted to be with her mother and to have the baby born at home. Lee naturally desired to attend her in the ordeal. But it could not be arranged. He had to remain near New York to discharge his duties on the Board of Engineers. During the last week of November, Mrs. Lee packed up, made ready to leave, and began her farewell visits to her friends. Her actual departure was delayed a short time because of an accident to the second boy, William Henry Fitzhugh, who already was nicknamed Rooney. This adventuresome young man, being of the mature age of eight, climbed into the hayloft in the absence of the family and succeeded in cutting off the tips of two of his fingers while experimenting with the chopping knife. For some days it was doubtful whether the ends of the digits would re-knit where the doctor sewed them back. He may probably lose his fingers and be maimed for life. Lee wrote Custis. You cannot conceive what I suffer at the thought. For several nights, the father sat by the lad's bedside lest Rooney should disturb the dressing or break the ligatures while tossing in his sleep. As a man and as a parent, Lee was singularly sensitive to personal beauty and always seems to have had an inward shuddering at any deformity.
Fortunately, in this case, Rooney's fingers were saved and he grew up to manhood physically as magnificent as his father. It pleased Lee, however, to pretend that this youngster was ugly. He described him to Henry Kaiser as a large heavy fellow who required a tight rein, a big, two-fisted fellow with an appetite that does honor to his big mouth. He never jested about the looks of his daughters, whom nature had slighted in that respect while favoring their brothers. When the family went to Arlington, after Rooney was well enough to travel, Lee was left for as lonesome a time as he had known since 1839 at St. Louis. His distress, he wrote Mrs. Lee, had communicated itself to the servants. I do not know, he said, whether it was your departure or my somber fizz which brought Miss Leary out on Sunday in a full suit of mourning. A black alpaca trimmed with crepe and a thick row of jet buttons on each sleeve, from the shoulder to the wrist, and three rows on the skirt, diverging from the waist to the hem, it was, however, surmounted by a dashing cap with gay ribbons. His chief companion was the family's little black antenne terrier speck, son of Dart, whom Lee had picked up one day in the Narrows, where it was supposed she had fallen from a passing ship. Dart's tail and ears had been cropped, but Lee would not permit her puppy to be treated in this way. Speck was duly grateful and insisted on going regularly to church with the family. Now that his master was alone, he spent his time with Lee in the office, whenever he could. But Lee was not always in his office. He had to visit New York every day, probably to attend meetings of the Board of Engineers, and he chose to make the journey on horseback alternating his mounts Jerry and Tom. He found New York very cold in January, with sleighs in the place of wheeled vehicles. Among the sleighs was a large one named Oregon, about which he wrote, I did not learn how many passengers it carried. But they went the whole or none. The girls returning from school were the prettiest sight, held on each other's laps with their bags of books and smiling faces. Indeed, there was no lack of customers at sixpence a ride, and you might be accommodated with a lady in your lap in the bargain. Think of a man of my forbidding countenance having such an offer but I peeped under her veil before accepting and though I really could not find fault either with her appearance or age, after a little demurring preferred giving her my seat. I thought it would not sound well if repeated in the latitude of Washington that I had ridden down B. D. Broadway with a strange woman in my lap. He showed like caution in all his dealings with the fair sex. It will be recalled that he had assured Jack McKay in 1834, I would not be unmarried for all you could offer me, and he never changed his mind or his morals. The dramatic skill of Fanny Kemble had enchanted him as a young married man, and when he was around 35 he confided to Henry Kaiser, you are right in my interest in pretty women, it is strange that I do not lose it with age. But I perceive no diminution. It was, however, no more than interest. Early in the new year, 1846, word came from Arlington that the new baby had arrived, a girl, who was named Mildred Child, after Lee's younger sister in Paris. She was the seventh child, and the last, born when her father was 39 and her mother 38. Her coming made the girls of the family number four. Custis, the oldest boy, was then in his fourteenth year, Mary was eleven, Rooney was nearing nine, and very penitent about the chopping knife, Annie was six and a half, Agnes was five, Robert was two and a half, and Mildred was in her cradle. The brood had almost doubled since he had left St. Louis, and his responsibilities to it had increased even more, because his children were growing older. Lee always considered that his wife was lenient with the new generation, and though harsh discipline was wholly contrary to his nature, he felt that he must take a hand in the rearing of the youngsters, his boys particularly. It was about this time, when Custis was beginning to do battle with algebra, that Lee started the long series of letters in which he sought to give his sons guidance, help, admonition, and counsel in their careers. For years his messages to his boys were full of solemn preachments, adorned with monitory instances, and in one case with a story that the revered Horatio Alger might have coveted for his pages. I do not think, he said, I ever told you of a fine boy I heard of in my travels this winter. He lived in the mountains of New Hampshire. He was just thirteen years of age, the age of Custis. His father was a farmer, and he used to assist him to work on the farm as much as he could. The snow there this winter was deeper than it has been for years, and one day he accompanied his father to the woods to get some wood. They went with their wood sled, and, after cutting a load and loading the sled, this little boy, whose name was Harry, drove it home while his father cut another load.
He had a fine team of horses and returned very quickly when he found his father lying prostrate on the frozen snow under a large limb of a tree he had felled during his absence, which had caught him in his fall and thrown him to the ground. He was cold and stiff, and little Harry, finding that he was not strong enough to relieve him from his position, seized his axe and cut off the limb and rolled it off of him. He then tried to raise him, but his father was dead and his feeble efforts were all in vain. Although he was far out in the woods by himself, and had never before seen a dead person, he was nothing daunted, but backed his sled close up to his father, and with great labor got the body on it, and placing his head in his lap, drove home to his mother as fast as he could. The efforts of his mother to reanimate him were equally vain with his own, and the sorrowing neighbors came and dug him a grave under the cold snow, and laid him quietly to rest. His mother was greatly distressed at the loss of her husband, but she thanked God who had given her so good and brave a son. You and Custis must take great care of your kind mother and dear sisters when your father is dead. To do that you must learn to be good. The choice of such a story as this for the admonition of a lad was itself a commentary on the simplicity of the sire. It was only when the boys became young men that Lee slowly dropped his moralizing and came to rely more on the effects of his personal relationship with his sons. Mildred made her appearance when Lee had been at the Narrows nearly five years. He had done much to improve the forts during that time and had learned no little about the location of coast and harbor defenses. His logic had sharpened Colonel Totten's appeal for the better fortification of New York. A practical method had been suggested by him for procuring the sites of Forts Richmond and Tompkins, which were the property of the state of New York. The United States owned old Fort Gansford, far up the harbor. Buildings had sprung up around the fort. It was quite useless for defense, why not acquire Tompkins and Richmond by trading Fort Gansford, which New York could readily divide into lots and sell. This proposal, as far as is known, originated with Lee, and it was now about to be adopted by slow-moving congressmen, stirred by the reflection that New York might have been captured if the Oregon controversy had led to war with England. Superintending dull repair work at the Narrows, sharing in the plans of the Board of Engineers, and contributing a few suggestions for the better defense of New York were, when all was said, a scant return for five of the most valuable years of Lee's life. He was burdened, too, with the unpleasant details of much accounting, some of it especially obnoxious. Subscription to a newspaper had provoked correspondence. A mistake that led him to draw pay twice for May and June, 1845, was readily accepted by his superiors as no more than a mistake, but it distressed him profoundly. It has cost me more mortification, he wrote the adjutant general, than any other act of my life, to find that I have been culpably negligent where the strictest accuracy is both necessary and required. Lee was settling down, in short, to another year of the formalized routine of an army engineer when word reached Washington on April 7, 1846, that the Mexican government had again refused to receive the American minister, John Slidell, who was returning to the United States. On May 9 dispatches were received from Brevet Brigadier General Zachary Taylor, announcing that his forces and the Mexicans had clashed on April 25, near the Rio Grande, in territory over which President Polk claimed a title. On May 11, Polk laid the facts before Congress, which declared war two days later. Meantime, unknown to the administration, Taylor had met a force of Mexicans at Palo Alto on May 8, and again at Resaca de la Palma on May 9, and had defeated it. 20,000 volunteers were soon called for from the southern states. All the talk in Washington was of preparations, appointments, and expeditions. The line officers, of course, expected to be sent to Mexico as soon as a plan of operations was determined upon. But the engineers, especially those in charge of work at the forts, would they be given duty in the field? Nobody knew anything of anyone's prospective assignments except that General Scott had overplayed his hand, was in disfavor, and had been forced to eat humble pie in a letter which he had composed in answer to one from the Secretary of War, received, as Scott wrote, at about 6 p.m., as I sat down to take a hasty plate of soup. Excited as the country was, it chuckled over that soup. Lee could only wait and, like all soldiers, hope for a part in the campaign the administration was feverishly, if unmethodically, planning. If he were left at Fort Hamilton, he might as well reconcile himself to the certainty that he would grow old, unregarded in a corps that would assuredly give preference to the engineers who distinguished themselves in war.
they would have fame, he would have slippers and old age on the porch at Arlington, as merely another retired army officer. But if he were sent to Mexico and had a chance. For three months after the declaration of war that have hung in his mind. Ruefully he went over to Governor's Island and wistfully he said farewell to the men bound for Mexico. Returning, he found his work at the Fort Duller now than ever, because Kearney was advancing on Santa Fe, Taylor was gathering troops at Camargo for a march on Monterey, and Santa Ana had slipped through the blockade at Vera Cruz, inwardly mocking the Americans who connived at his entry in the belief that he would be willing to make a favorable peace. Then on August 19, 1846, Lee got the letter he was hoping to receive orders from the chief engineer to turn over his work at the Narrows to Major Richard Delafield, to proceed, via Washington, to San Antonio de Bejar, Texas, and to report to Brigadier General John E. Wool for service in Mexico. Twenty-one years after he had entered West Point, opportunity had come to Captain Lee of the Engineers. Chapter 13, A Campaign Without a Cannon Shot Making up his statements as quickly as possible, Lee turned over the work at the Narrows to the capable Delafield and hurried to Washington, where he filed his accounts on August 28, 1846. Three days later he made his will. As he prepared his kit for field service his friends insisted on giving him presents for it, among them a bottle of much-praised whiskey, which politeness compelled him to accept and to take with him. He had always moved promptly on receipt of orders, and now, under the spur of opportunity, he lost no time in adieus, even to the proud but anxious household at Arlington. On the first available steamer he traveled to New Orleans, where he was surprised to find, despite the flow of government funds in the purchase of supplies, that treasury notes were at a discount of two and a half percent, a fact that grieved his thrifty soul. From the busy Louisiana base he embarked for Port La Vaca, a Texas port town, on the bay of the same name, 120 miles down the coast of Texas from Galveston, through Pas Cavallo. Arriving there on September 13, 1846, he spent his first night on land at Sarasa with a French family, M. and Madame Monod. The next day he took horse for San Antonio, then styled San Antonio de Bejar, which he reached on September 21, a month and two days after he had been relieved of duty at Fort Hamilton. It was a very rapid journey for the times. The quaint border town had a civilian population of about 2,000, chiefly farmers and herdsmen, many of them Mexicans. It bore many marks of the war for Texas independence, and in its externals was still foreign. The old missions, the so-called palaces, and the ruins of the Alamo, where the Texas garrison had been slaughtered ten years previously, all these were unlike anything Lee had ever seen before. The town's past, however, was engulfed in its present, and its quiet streets were swamped with soldiers. Two squadrons of regular cavalry were there, one battery of regular artillery, three companies of the 6th Infantry, two regiments of Illinois Infantry, and a sufficient sprinkling of other volunteers to raise the total to 3,400 men. The atmosphere was one of excited preparation, for it was known to everyone that the troops were to start an advance into Mexico as soon as supplies were accumulated and equipment was complete. It was Lee's first contact, after 21 years of military service, with the contagious elation that pervades a camp when the talk is of a march into the enemy's country. With that same spirit he was to become grimly familiar before he was to unbuckle his sword for the last time. The commander of this expedition, the officer to whom Lee reported on arrival, was Brigadier General John E. Wool, the same Wool who had come to Fort Monroe for an inspection of the engineering work not long before General McComb's order that had ended Lee's labors under Captain Andrew Talcott. Wool had grizzled much since the hot day in July, 1834, when he had been rowed out to Fort Calhoun with Lieutenant Lee. He had received his promotion to the rank of brigadier in 1841, and in the years since Lee had been with him in Hampton Roads he had directed the transfer of the Cherokee Indians west of the Mississippi, but otherwise had been engaged in routine duties. He was now 62, and although he had not heard a gun fired in action for 31 years, he was full of ardor and was organizing his forces with real skill. Among the line officers at San Antonio, Lee probably found few whom he had met before, but on the staff were a number of West Pointers, some of whom served in his own corps or in the affiliated topographical engineers. To this latter service belonged a busy young lieutenant named William B. Franklin, who was then making ready to set out on a reconnaissance. Sixteen years later, almost to the very day, that same Franklin was to be in command of some very troublesome troops at a place called Crampton's Gap, in South Mountain, Maryland.
Another man of whom Lee heard much talk at the time of his arrival was one of General Wool's aides de camp, Irvin McDowell, first lieutenant of artillery, then absent, none other than the McDowell whose threatened march on Richmond from the north had to be taken into account when Lee, on June 1, 1862, assumed command in front of the Confederate capital. The officer with whom Lee had the closest official relations, from the very day he reached San Antonio, was Captain William D. Fraser of the Corps of Engineers, a New Yorker who had graduated from West Point at the head of the class of 1834. Fraser was seven years younger than Lee but had risen fast in the Army and had been commissioned captain on the same day as Lee, who doubtless had met him before they came to Texas. Fraser had worked assiduously under Wool's orders and had well in hand most of the engineering arrangements for the expedition. General Wool, therefore, did not supersede him on the arrival of Captain Lee, but, it would appear, associated Lee with Fraser, more or less as a supplementary officer, not assigned to definite duty. Lee's first task was to assist in the collection of tools for use in road and bridge building. San Antonio had few artisans, prices were very high, and neither Lee nor Fraser had any government funds with which to make purchases. Progress accordingly was slow, and results were discouraging. Two days after Lee arrived, and while he and Captain Fraser were searching for picks and shovels, the topographical engineers set out to find the best road for General Wool's advance. The four officers who had this distinction must have been the envy of the whole camp as they rode off under Captain George W. Hughes, with their guide and their interpreter, their wagons having gone ahead. Young Franklin was one of this quartet. The expedition had not long to wait after the topographical engineers started. On September 28, a column of some 1954 men moved out of San Antonio, toward the Rio Grande. The rear guard was to follow with delayed supplies. It was the first time that Lee, though he was not far from his 40th birthday, had ever ridden with troops on a march against the enemy. Indeed, it may have been the first time since he left West Point that he had been with a column. General Wool's advance was in accordance with the tentative and incomplete plan of campaign that had been slowly formulated after war had been declared. Mexico had conceded to Texas a boundary line no farther south than the River Nueces, which is approximately 130 miles north of the Rio Grande. President Polk claimed the territory running south to the Rio Grande and in March, 1846, had sent General Zachary Taylor forward to occupy it. Taylor had reached the river on March 28 at a point opposite the Mexican town of Matamoros, where he had entrenched himself in the works later known as Fort Brown. The efforts of the Mexicans to force him to abandon the line of the Rio Grande had led to the battles of Palo Alto and Resica de la Palma. Following up his successes, Taylor had crossed the Rio Grande on May 18 and had occupied Matamoros, from which the enemy had fled. There he had remained until July 30th, when he had started up the river to Camargo to undertake his part of the larger operations upon which the administration by that time had determined. The plan was this, one small column was to be sent to seize New Mexico, another was to cooperate with the Navy in upsetting the Mexican government of California. With these possessions taken from the enemy and held as war indemnity, General Taylor was to advance from the Rio Grande to Monterey, and General Wool, acting under Taylor's orders, was to go forward from the river to Chihuahua. These two advances were thus to be as shown on the opposite page. The hope was that these operations and a strict blockade of the eastern coast would bring northern Mexico under American control. Nothing beyond this had been decided. The administration knew little about the country that was to be entered. The general staff was not certain whether Wolf could reach Chihuahua, whether it was really important that he should do so, or whether he and Taylor could subsist their troops on local supplies if they were to attempt to move southward toward Mexico City after they had reached their first objectives. The strength of the Mexican forces in nearby districts was equally unknown. Washington waited on Taylor for a more definite plan, Taylor waited on Washington for more extensive orders. An uneventful march of 164 miles in 11 days brought Wool's first column to the Rio Grande, just east of the Presidio named after the river. The rapidity of this advance was attributed by one observer to the indefatigable exertions of those distinguished officers, Captains Lee and Fraser, Fraser, who built a road and bridged the streams. Being now on the boundary claimed by the United States, the army on its next advance would assume the offensive in Mexican territory. The ardor of every soldier was inflamed at the thought. We have met with no resistance yet, Lee wrote his wife. 
The Mexicans who were guarding the passage retired on our approach. There has been a great wetting of knives, grinding of swords, and sharpening of bayonets ever since we reached the river. Invasion was not, however, easily begun. The few fords of the Rio Grande were deep, and the current was swift. It was necessary to camp on the American side of the river until the engineers could place a bridge with the pontoons Captain Fraser had built at San Antonio and had brought forward in the wagon train. Lee doubtless had a hand in this. He probability assisted, also, in choosing and running the lines of the field defenses that General Wool ordered the engineers to construct at the bridgeheads. It was the first earthwork he ever constructed of the general type that he, more than any one man, was to develop in utility. On October 12, the bridge having been completed, the whole force passed over to the right bank of the Rio Grande. There, under a flag of truce, a Mexican officer, escorted by a contingent of lancers, was awaiting General Wool. He brought news that was more pleasant to the Americans than to the messenger, General Taylor had advanced to Monterey and after a battle there had forced the Mexican troops to withdraw. The articles of capitulation had provided that the Mexicans should march out of the town with their arms and should retire beyond a designated line. The forces of the United States, the sixth article of capitulation read, will not advance beyond the line, before the expiration of eight weeks, or until the orders or instructions of the respective governments can be received. This had been signed on September 24. The Mexican officer exhibited a copy of the paper and insisted that General Wool's advance directly contravened the agreement, which virtually declared an armistice. Wool, of course, was delighted at Taylor's success, of which he had previously received no definite information, and he did not consider that the first stages of the advance he had in contemplation were violative of the agreement. He accordingly sent back word that he would continue his march. The Mexican withdrew as he had come. In the hearts of inexperienced soldiers, ambitious for battle, this incident raised hope of early action. Anywhere, they reasoned, an enemy might be lurking, the very next day they might have opportunity of capturing a Monterey of their own. Expectancy tightened. But how, meantime, would the column proceed? Inquiry showed no direct western route to Chihuahua. The only way to reach the city was to move southward and take one of the few roads that ran northwestward from the general vicinity of Monclova, which was about 200 miles south of the American camp near the Rio Grande. That, then, must be the line of advance. With high heart the army followed a route the topographical engineers selected and on October 30 reached the environs of Monclova. Not an enemy was seen, not a gun was fired at a human mark, some of the enthusiasm of the army began to exhaust itself as the days passed in hard marches through a dull country. Nor was this uneventful march the only disappointment of the soldiers, General Wool considered that he had now reached a position where the Monterey armistice applied and that he could not go farther until it expired. This meant nearly three weeks around Monclova, a town of 8,000, cleaner and more pleasant than most Mexican cities, but no place, surely, for a rest of army to wait. General Wool kept the men occupied with drills and exercised his talents for organization by establishing depots and a hospital. The spirit of the volunteers, however, did not respond to routine duties. Wool became doubtful of his ability to control them during a period of prolonged inaction, and he so notified General Taylor. While waiting for the expiration of the armistice, Wool continued to study the routes to Chihuahua. He concluded there was no practicable road for an army unless he moved almost to Saltilla and thence followed the route via Paris. This seemed so circuitous a way to an objective of such uncertain value that he proposed the abandonment of that expedition and requested Taylor, instead, to permit him to move on Saltilla. He asked, also, to be allowed to break up his old line of communications and to open a new and shorter line by way of Camargo, which was already being used as Taylor's principal depot. Lee was fairly busy during this time. Captain Fraser had gone back during the march to Monclova in order to conduct the rear guard, which had subsequently advanced from San Antonio under Colonel Sylvester Churchill. After Fraser came up with Churchill on November 6, the engineers examined Monclova and its vicinity with a view to its defense in the future. This was no easy task, for the town was commanded by hills. Nevertheless, the two officers selected a site and made ready to build a redoubt. Lee prepared, in addition, a rough map of the town and its environs.
he had, ere this, established himself in the good opinion of General Wool, and though he had thus far received no important independent assignments to duty, he was apprised of Wool's problems and plans. The Monterey Armistice expired on November 19, according to Wool's interpretation of its terms, so, on the 18th, he pushed his advance guard forward. That night he received an express from General Taylor. This directed him to maintain his position at Monclova, to abandon the plan of operations against Chihuahua, and to open the proposed new line of communications with Camargo. A few days later he was authorized to move on Paris, whence he could join Taylor, or unite with Worth at Saltilla, or march on Chihuahua, if changed circumstances required. On November 24, leaving five companies of Illinois volunteers to guard Monclova, the column took up its southward march. A pioneer detachment that had been organized at Monclova from the Illinois troops was sent ahead under Fraser and Lee and prepared the roads for the main army. Through the efforts of the quartermaster's department, tools for this work were at last available. The pioneers must have worked hard, for the march of the infantry was fast and uninterrupted, though some parts of the road, even when repaired, were rough and difficult for the artillery and wagons. Seventy miles from Monclova, the troops left the Saltilla Road and struck west for Paris. Northers, fast-changing temperature, dust, and heat taxed the endurance of the soldiers. But Wool kept them moving. Ten days after the start, the army halted near Paris, and on the following day it took position in a broad plain about two miles north of the city. The distance covered on the march was computed at from 165 to 181 miles. The column was now about 365 miles within the enemy's country and had not seen a single Mexican soldier since bidding farewell to the officer and lancers who had met the vanguard at the crossing of the Rio Grande. Part of Taylor's army, under General W. J. Worth, was at Saltilla, about 100 miles eastward, as the roads ran. Presumably there was an enemy in front of Worth, but here at Paris there was hospitality rather than hostility, a welcome rather than a battle. Our camp, wrote the chronicler of the expedition, was constantly crowded with the beauty and fashion of the town, who visited the tents of the officers without hesitation or restraint, and the most cordial feelings and intercourse were established between us. It was a dull experience, however, despite the visits of the ladies, for men who had come to Mexico anticipating daily battles and hourly opportunity for feats of daring. Nearly two weeks went by at Paris, with no alarms and no promise of excitement. Then, on December 17, there came a hurried messenger from General Worth. The Mexicans were preparing to attack Saltilla, Worth wrote, and he wanted Wool, if possible, to reinforce him. Wool immediately decided to do so, and determined to move at once and at top speed, because his only practicable road to Saltilla lay, in part, by the route the enemy would certainly take in moving on that city. If the Mexicans reached the Hacienda of La Encantala, on the road from San Luis Potosí to Saltilla, a junction between Worth and Wool would be impossible and both American forces might be wiped out. Orders were given to break camp and to put the column in motion. Soon there was hustle and excitement everywhere, no man in the ranks knowing whether the enemy was a hundred miles away or just over the horizon. Thanks to the good organization that Wool had set up, the head of the column moved within two hours after word had been given to break camp. For the next four days, there was no rest for anyone, except when men and horses became exhausted. Fearful that the threat against Worth might be serious, and that Saltilla might soon be attacked, Wool kept up a forced march. Much of his line of advance lay through a valley and part of it through mountains from Patagolana to Castanula. Here again, the engineers had to improve the road to make it practicable for the wagon train and the guns. Progress on that part of the march was necessarily very slow, but on the better stretches of the road the infantry made 35 miles one day and almost as far another day. Not only so, but an officer who followed the troops reported that with the exception of the campsites he saw no evidence that an army had passed. Not a broken wagon, or a dead animal, or a straggler was to be seen. On the evening of December 20, being close to the positions the foe might be expected to occupy in an advance on Saltilla, Wolf sent forward a reconnoitering party. It returned with a report that no enemy was to be found. The next day the little army moved forward again and encamped near Agua Nueva, some 17 miles south of Saltilla.
The troops had come more than 100 miles in four days, a very good performance, but they were denied the battle they expected to fight upon arrival. For it developed that the reported advance of the enemy was a false alarm and that all Wool's haste had been to no purpose. As he nursed his bruised and sore feet, the soldier in the ranks found small compensation in reflecting that the forced march had brought about a very desirable concentration of the United States troops in the zone where the enemy might most reasonably be expected to attack, whenever that might be. Wool's long separation from the other forces had been a jest among the soldiers of Taylor, whose favorite gag was, when did you hear from General Wool? But now that they had emerged from the wilderness the fine discipline of Wool's men evoked much praise. Lee now found himself with one division of what was immeasurably the largest body of troops he had ever seen, fully 6,000 men. Once the reconnaissances were made and the camp was laid out he had no special duties until Christmas Eve when Captain Fraser received orders to report at Monterey. This left Lee the senior engineer officer with wool. For the time being, his new responsibilities were negligible. That evening his mind turned homeward, where he knew his children were preparing for Christmas. From his tent he wrote Custis and Rooney, I hope good Santa Claus will fill my Rob's stocking tonight, that Mildred's, Agnes's and Annie's may break down with good things. I do not know what he may have for you and Mary, but if he only leaves for you one half of what I wish, you will want for nothing. I have frequently thought if I had one of you on each side of me riding on ponies, such as I could get you, I would be comparatively happy. Shortly after breakfast Christmas morning a hurried message from some of the subsistence officers was sent to headquarters, the enemy was coming. Great clouds of dust had been seen in the line of his advance. The alarm was sounded at once. The men were ordered to stand to their arms, General Butler was notified and was asked for orders. Lee immediately hurried out from camp and found a good point of observation. There he threw himself on the grass, his bridle rein over his arm, and focused his telescope on the gap in the mountains through which the Mexicans would have to advance. Behind him the troops only awaited his report that the enemy had been sighted, for General Butler sent word that as soon as the Mexicans approached, Wool's little army was to fall back. The Mexicans, however, did not make their appearance, Lee wrote his wife that night. Many regrets were expressed at Santa Ana's having spoiled our Christmas dinner for which ample preparations had been made. The little roasters remained tied to the tent pins wondering at their deferred fate and the headless turkeys retained their plumage unscathed. Finding the enemy did not come, preparations were again made for dinner. The feast did not awaken enthusiasm in Lee's heart. He found, instead, what comfort he could in writing Mrs. Lee. We have had many happy, happy Christmases together, he said. It is the first time we have been entirely separated at this holy time since our marriage. I hope it does not interfere with your happiness, surrounded as you are by father, mother, children, and dear friends. I therefore trust you are well and happy, and that this is the last time I shall be absent from you during my life. May God preserve and bless you till then and forever is my constant prayer. The language differed little from that which he was to employ in a letter written on a dark Christmas day, with far greater issues at stake, fifteen years thereafter. Investigation proved that the clouds of smoke seen by the subsistence officers had been raised by the Arkansas cavalry, which had been out reconnoitering, but rumor and military logic still represented Santa Ana as close at hand. On December 28, there came another false alarm, which caused General Butler to order General Wolfe to move his force back where it would have the support of the other troops. The site chosen by Butler, much to Wool's disgust, was Encantada, at the entrance to the valley that leads to Saltia. It was a most uncomfortable place, where the command, in Wool's grumbling words, was exposed to high winds and almost constant clouds of dust. Wool was getting skeptical, by this time, of all the false alarms of Mexican activity near at hand, and when a new report came one evening of a great force marching down on the Americans, he determined to ascertain the enemy's position. Lee happened to be with him at the time and volunteered to make the required scout. The general at once accepted Lee's offer, told him to procure a guide, and gave orders that a company of cavalry should meet him at the outer picket line and go with him. Lee found a young man, the son of a neighboring old Mexican, who knew the country, and he prevailed upon him to act as his guide. Before they set out, Lee showed the Mexican his brace of pistols and gave him to understand that if he played him false, he should have the contents of them. In some way Lee missed the cavalry escort at the picket line. 
Rather than search for it and waste hours of darkness, he determined to press on with no other companion than the unwilling native. They had not ridden many miles when they saw in the road, by the aid of a bright moon's full rays, the tracks of many wagons and mules. Lee examined these closely to see if he could discern whether artillery had been along. As he found no evidence of this, he reasoned that a wagon train had traversed the road after the guns had passed. The wagons, he concluded, evidently had been used for foraging or reconnoitering and were now returning to camp. This seemed strong evidence that the enemy was near at hand, but wishing to confirm it by closer reconnaissance, Lee decided to push on until he came to the Mexican picket line. A long ride brought him no sign of the enemy, and no challenge from picket or outpost, but a little later he saw the light of numerous campfires on a hill not far away. This was enough for the Mexican guide, who doubtless decided that if he and the hard-riding American officer were captured he would be hanged as a spy and traitor. He besought Lee to turn back. There was a stream near the place where the lights were burning, he insisted, there could be no doubt that an army had chosen that site for its camp. They must return or they would be caught. Lee was not quite satisfied. He let the native stay where he was and rode on alone. Presently, he was rewarded by the sight of what seemed to be a large number of tents on the hillside. Some impulse carried him still farther, through a little sleeping town and down to the stream, across which he could hear loud talking and noise. He was now so close that he could see clearly and could realize that the white objects he had taken for tents were a large flock of sheep, part of a caravan that was moving to market and had stopped by the road for the night. Undisturbed, Lee crossed the stream and, with the little Spanish he possessed, questioned the drovers. They were as much surprised by his appearance as he was at finding them to be peaceable herdsmen and they told him the Mexican army was still on the other side of the mountains. With many thanks and adios, Lee rejoined his guide and hurried back to camp to find something of a hubbub over his failure to return sooner. General Wool, suspecting duplicity, had sent for the father of the guide and was holding him prisoner, with threats to hang him if Lee were not forthcoming. The Mexican, said Lee, in recounting the story long afterwards, was the most delighted man to see me. Lee had ridden forty miles, but with the information given him by the drovers he felt that he could speedily locate the Mexican forces. He rested three hours, changed mounts and started again with a cavalry escort. This time he went much farther than during the night, and when he returned it was with fairly definite news of the position of the enemy. Wool apparently believed that hard work was the best reward of the men who had done it, and shortly after Lee's reconnaissance he named him acting inspector general without relieving him as engineer. Scarcely had Lee assumed these duties than there came another wild report of Santa Ana's advance with a great force. This caused Butler to order Wool's withdrawal to Buena Vista, a place six miles from Saltilla and destined to have fame as the scene of a hard battle the following month. The change brought relief from the dust and drafts of Incantada, but it probably brought, also, several days of hard labor for Lee in locating a new camp and in making good its approaches. Pleased as General Wool was at leaving Incantada, he was growing weary of continuous wild tales of Santa Ana's advance. General Taylor was even more disgusted at the endless reports of threatened attacks that never materialized. Lee chanced to be at Taylor's headquarters one day when an excited young officer announced that he had seen 20,000 Mexican troops moving up with 250 guns. Captain, asked Taylor, do you say that you saw that force? Yes, General, said the officer. Captain, answered the General, if you say you saw it, of course I must believe you, but I would not have believed it if I had seen it myself. The old general's critical attitude toward exaggerated reports of the enemy's strength made a deep impression on Lee. Sixteen years later, on the field of Chancellorsville, he was to meet a wild report of the Federal's movements and strength with a recountal of Taylor's answer that day at Buena Vista. It was not alone of Santa Ana's movements that rumor spread among the waiting troops. By the middle of January, 1847, it was whispered everywhere that another American army was mustering on the coast and that a descent was to be made on Vera Cruz by General Scott. For once, campfire gossip was right. The previous November, Scott had prepared a detailed plan for an attack on the principal Mexican Gulf port, and while Lee was tracking the drover's caravan, Scott was at Brazos de Santiago, off the mouth of the Rio Grande, gathering ships and supplies for what he expected would be the major operation of the war.
Campaigning without a cannon shot was about to end, for Captain Lee in particular. Chapter 14 First Experiences Under Fire Vera Cruz When Captain Lee learned of the Vera Cruz expedition is uncertain. Nor is it known whether he exerted himself to procure a transfer to Scott's army. There is no evidence to bear out the tradition that Scott particularly requested that Lee be sent to him. Scott's order book shows no such entry, and his correspondence with the War Department discloses few requests for the services of individual staff officers. He wrote General Butler, I do not wish to ask, specifically, for the chief of any branch of the general staff now on duty under the orders of Major General Taylor. It may have been that Scott requested Lee's services, in spite of the absence of any record to that effect, it is more probable that Lee's name was mentioned to Scott by Colonel Totten, who had been chosen chief engineer of the expedition that was to operate farther south. Totten was then 59, and though he possessed extraordinary physical endurance, he doubtless wished to associate with him the best of his young subordinates. Whatever their inspiration, Lee received orders about January 16, 1847, to proceed to Brazos and there to join General Scott. Lee was doubtless overjoyed to go, for he was not advantageously placed with General Wool. He was to show, very shortly, that he possessed the strategic sense that is indispensable at Army headquarters, but with Wool, he had no opportunities of displaying it. In northern Mexico, he could only have had a suitable opening at the headquarters of General Taylor, and thither he had small chance of receiving a transfer, though he and Taylor were fourth cousins, whether they were aware of it or not. With hasty farewells and high hopes, Lee left Will about January 17, 1847, just before his 40th birthday. Mounted on his mare, Creole, he made a long ride of more than 250 miles. He probably was in the company of some of the troops sent from Taylor's army to Scott, much to the indignation of the Taylor and his lieutenants. The journey was completed without mishap or hardship. Creole was in such good condition when Lee rode her into Brazos that she attracted no little attention. Lee found General Scott immersed in preparations for the descent on Vera Cruz, fuming at every wasted hour and writing vigorous letters to all whom he accounted guilty of delaying the start of the expedition. The newly arrived captain of engineers was received as a member of the general staff attached to Scott's headquarters. He stepped overnight, as it were, from the execution of small operations to the planning of great enterprises, and although he did not know it, he had started up the ladder of fame. He found himself, too, in the company of friends, among them Major John L., Smith of the Engineers and Joe Johnston, his sworn comrade of West Point and Fort Monroe. When the time came for quarters to be assigned on shipboard, Johnston and Lee were given a cabin together on the general's ship, the Massachusetts. Creole and one of his other horses Lee left in the care of Jim Connolly, his orderly, for fear that if they were forwarded by the army hostlers they would be injured aboard ship. Even as it was, Lee was destined to worry over the rough handling his mounts might be forced to endure. I hope they may both reach the shore again in safety, he wrote his sons, but I fear they will have a hard time. They will first have to be put aboard a steamboat and carried to the ship that lies about two miles out at sea, then hoisted in, and how we shall get them ashore again, I do not know. Probably throw them overboard and let them swim there. On February 15, 1847, Scott raised his red pennant and led the way down the coast toward Tampico, where some 6,000 American soldiers were awaiting transports. Three days later, the convoy was off the mouth of the Panuco. Seen from the river, Tampico must have stirred the imagination of Lee and the other soldiers. It was built on the side of a hill rising on the right bank of the stream. A wide, well-paved marketplace stood between the wharves and the red and white houses of the principal citizens. But Tampico, like many another city, presented its best side to the visitor. Its back streets and its suburbs contained wretched rows of gloomy shacks, sheltering a population deep in poverty. The next morning, February 19, Lee went ashore in the suite of General Scott, whose known love of pomp and display was to be gratified to the fullest that day by the waiting regiments in Tampico. The troops had all been paid off on the 18th and were in a humor to contribute to a holiday. As Scott and his staff approached, Lee saw the riverbank lined with soldiers while the heaviest guns barked a salute. At the landing below the marketplace, the artillery were drawn up, and large details of infantry kept back the multitude of Mexicans who were intent on seeing the leader of the hated Lankies, as the worthy Tampicoans styled the Yankees.
When Scott stepped on land, the band from Governor's Island struck up a tune, and all the high officers then ashore came forward to pay their respects. They had a mount at hand for Scott, a fine grey horse, with handsome trappings, but the general declined to ride. His great bulk rising above that of all the large men of his staff and escort, he strode across the marketplace and up the streets to the quarters that had been selected for him. All Tampico seemed to be looking out of the windows at him or gaping from the pavement. Scott was soon deep in conferences with the commanders, so Lee had some time for sightseeing in the town. In the company of Major Smith, he had a taste of the boasted Mexican chocolate, which greatly pleased his companion. He soon began to meet old acquaintances, among them Lieutenant William Barry, whom he had known at the Narrows in New York Harbor. As a lover of animals, Lee kept an eye open, also, for the town's showing in horses, donkeys, and ponies, and when he wanted to have a look at the fortifications he procured a pony for the purpose. Altogether, it was a diverting and exciting day. For many of the men it ended in a disastrous conflict with the strong drink of Mexico. Everybody talked, everybody knew what was just told him, everybody was delighted and everybody made a night of it, except the town guard, and it had a night of it, for there was the sound of revelry on the banks of the Panuco. Drunken soldiers and drunken sailors fraternized, and the long bitter oath of the western volunteer and teamster drowned the caramba of the Mexican. The full moon came up to lighten the scene, while the glowing fires and the fiery furnaces of the steamers in the river threw a lurid glare upon the heavy armaments bristling upon their decks. On February 20, Lee steamed southward again with Scott aboard the Massachusetts. This time their destination was the island of Lobos, the rendezvous of the fleet, 70 miles south of Tampico and 200 miles up the Gulf Coast from Veracruz. Part of the passage was rough and most discomforting to Joe Johnston, but it did not disturb Lee, who found what company he could with the officers who possessed sea legs, among them Lt. John Sedgwick, formerly at the Narrows. The Massachusetts arrived off Lobos on February 21, but did not discharge her passengers because of the heavy weather. The place itself was so uninviting in appearance that the delay in landing could only have seemed a hardship to those who were still in the throes of mal de mer. Lobos was only a few feet above the surface of the sea, which broke in heavy surf. Barrenness was everywhere except for stunted shrubs. Even these had been cut away by the six regiments of American troops who had been landed and encamped there to prevent the spread of smallpox that had broken out aboard one of the ships. The day after Lee's arrival off Lobos, the guns of the Sloop St. Mary and the cannon on shore fired a salute in honor of Washington's birthday. Most of the troops celebrated the anniversary with such dinners as could be provided from the scant stores, and not a few of them found the liquor with which to drink toasts to the success of their adventure. Almost before rebellious stomachs had become quiet there came another storm that set the ships a-bobbing. General Scott, meantime, was getting more and more restless. His transports, surf boats, and supplies had been held back, he wrote, by no one of foresight, arrangement or energy on my part, as I dare affirm. The season was drawing on, if he did not capture Vera Cruz and get into a higher country before the beginning of April, the yellow fever would be fatal to the expedition. On February 25, he was able to re-embark the troops on the island, as the smallpox was under control, but even then he had to fume nearly a week before he could give the order to make sail. During this period of waiting Lee may have had some hand in preparing the orders for the guidance of the engineers after their landing at Vera Cruz. Otherwise, he was master of his own time. Some of his leisure he devoted to a long newsy letter to his older sons at home, a letter in which narrative was mingled with admonition in a somewhat emotional strain that he never employed except in addressing his boys. I shall not feel my long separation from you, he said, if I find that my absence has been of no injury to you, and that you have both grown in goodness and knowledge, as well as stature. But, ah, uh, how much I will suffer on my return if the reverse has occurred. You enter all my thoughts, into all my prayers, and on you, in part, will depend whether I shall be happy or miserable, as you know how much I love you. You must do all in your power to save me pain. The end of riding the tides off Lobos came on March 3. By no means all of Scott's transport was then at the island, and half his surfboats had not arrived, but he felt that what he had at hand was sufficient for the first stage of his operations. The red pennant was accordingly raised once more and the fleet began to make its way down the coast, headed by the steam vessels. Scott himself walked the Massachusetts from bow to stern, watching the movement of the other ships.
The soldiers on all the transports were cheering in high glee, and the sailors were singing. We are now bound for the shores of Mexico. And their Uncle Sam's soldiers we will land, hi, oh. The weather was favorable as the fleet continued southward before the wind. Shortly after noon on March 5, following the little brig porpoise, Lee saw Vera Cruz with its castle and a little later he sighted the American fleet that had been blockading the port for months. All around the Massachusetts and astern of her were transports, carrying their full canvas and maneuvering boldly, despite the reefs among the islands. As the incoming ships passed the men of war, the soldiers crowded the rail and sent up roars of greeting, to which the sailors instantly replied in kind. Some of the transports dropped anchor amid the warships to the lee of Isla Verde, directly off Vera Cruz, the others kept on eleven miles farther to the anchorage off Anton Lazardo, where many supply ships already were assembled. It must have been a day of many thrills for Captain Lee of the Engineers. Commodore David Connor, senior officer of the Navy in Mexican waters, had been in touch with Scott since December and had studied the coast carefully to determine where Scott's army could best effect a landing for the investment of Vera Cruz. A wise choice of a landing place was, of course, most important to the army, inasmuch as it was taken for granted that the Mexicans would offer the sternest resistance. The day after Scott's arrival, Connor invited the general, his principal officers, and his staff to make from the sea a reconnaissance of the landing places and of the town and fortress as well. Lee went with the rest aboard the steamer Patrita, and they ventured so close to the castle off Vera Cruz, San Juan de Aloa by name, that men on the other ships expected to see them blown out of the water. The castle opened on the Patrita when it was a mile and a half distant, but the fire went wild. It was the first hostile shot Captain Lee had ever heard as a soldier. A young lieutenant in the party, George Gordon Meade, who was later to be one of Lee's chief opponents, thought that General Scott took needless risks in going so close inshore, a single hit might have disabled the little ship, and two or three rounds more might have broken up the expedition. This reconnaissance brought General Scott to the opinion Commodore Connor already had formed, namely, that the best available landing place was on a sandy beach about three miles southeast of the walls of Vera Cruz, opposite the little island of Sacrificios. Anchorage was afforded here, sheltered by the island and used by foreign ships. It was a rather small roadstead, but it offered a measure of protection against the frequent northers that were and are the curse of the sailor's life off the Mexican coast. Immediately on his return from the reconnaissance Scott gave orders for a landing the following day at the selected beach. Hope and excitement both ran high. Dawn, however, brought rough weather and prompted postponement of the enterprise until the next morning. All the transports were sent down to Anton Lazardo because Scott had determined to transfer the troops to the men of war and thereby reduce the number of ships that had to be crowded into the Sacrificio's anchorage. March 9 was to Lee perhaps the most interesting day he had thus far spent as a soldier. Early in the morning the troops were placed in the surf boats and were rowed to the men of war, the decks of which were soon jammed with men, muskets, and equipment. When the soldiers had all been transferred, the band struck up, and the steamer started northward between 10 and 11 o'clock, headed by Commodore Connor's flagship, the Raritan, behind which came the Massachusetts. In perfect weather, the fleet passed over nine miles in two hours and dropped anchor in assigned positions at Sacrificios. The light Spitfire, under Commander Tatnall, and the Vixen, Commander Sands, together with five armed schooners, were running close ashore to cover the landing. Thus far, not a gun had been fired, though it was assumed that the Mexicans were in position behind the dunes and were merely biding their time. The crews of the three foreign men of war at Sacrificios and the men of the merchant ships riding there thronged rail and rigging to watch for the thunder to break as the Americans went ashore. It put me in mind, wrote one humble soldier in his diary, of seeing so many robins or blackbirds on a wild cherry tree or crows on trees watching the dead carcass lying beneath. The infantry were now returned to the surf boats, about fifty men in each, under a naval officer, with eight or ten sailors as oarsmen. The boats were then towed astern of the Princeton, which was anchored abreast of the landing place. At last all was ready, and the great moment was at hand. Every spectator on every ship within sight of the landing place waited breathlessly. The distant walls of Vera Cruz and of the castle, plainly visible, were covered by a multitude of excited people.
It was just before sunset, one observer wrote, an hour at which all the beauties of the Mexican coast are wont to stand out in bold and beautiful relief. The day had continued as clear as it had begun, and the breeze, as it died gradually away, had left behind it a glazed and unruffled sea. The magnificent mountain of Orizaba, with its snow-clad summit, which had been hid from view most of the day, suddenly revealed itself with startling distinctness and grandeur, the distant coffer of Perot loomed up, also, in blue and mystic beauty, and the bold and rugged outline of the coast seemed more bold and rugged still. None of this splendor was lost on Robert Lee, as he saw it from the poop deck of the Massachusetts. The division of Lee's old drillmaster, General Worth, contained most of the regular infantry in Scott's expedition and naturally had been chosen as the van. General Worth himself was to head the landing party. When word came that the boats were all loaded, Worth stepped down into a swift gig and took his place. A gun boomed out from the flagship, the surf boats cast off from the Princeton and formed in line abreast. The sailors bent to their task, and the bands once more struck up. A few tense moments, and the men of the 6th Infantry, forging ahead of the others, sprang out on the beach. Not a shot greeted them. Quickly the contingents of the other leading boats joined them and made a rush for the crest of the nearby sandhills. In an instant this high ground was won, and the flag of the United States was planted in plain view of all the ships. Not until then did it dawn on everyone that the landing was unopposed, through some unexplained miscalculation on the part of the Mexicans. In universal relief, a cheer rolled from the fleet and echoed on the sand dunes. With the landing of the Vera Cruz expedition began Lee's first real opportunity in the field. He had every advantage. General Scott had already formed a high opinion of Lee's ability and had included him in what he termed his little cabinet, consisting of Lee's own chief, Colonel Totten, Lieutenant Colonel Ethan A. Hitchcock, Acting Inspector General, Lee, and General Scott's son-in-law, Henry Lee Scott, who was the commander's assistant adjutant general and chief of staff. Lee was thus brought into close daily contact with Scott, who was a man quick to recognize merit and ready to take sound counsel, deferentially tendered, however pompous and dogmatic he seemed. Lee was, moreover, in the strongest branch of the general staff. Colonel Totten had seen to that. Directly under Totten was Major John L. Smith, next came Lee, and then a number of other officers of the highest promise, men who had stood at the very top of their respective classes at West Point. Among them was a youngster of 20, Brevet 2nd Lieutenant George B. McClellan, who had been number 2 in 1846 at the Military Academy. One step above him was 1st Lieutenant P.G. T. Beauregard, of the class of 1838. Another junior officer of fine abilities was Zealous B. Tower of Massachusetts, a 2nd Lieutenant, and number 1 in the class of 1841. In the affiliated corps of topographical engineers, besides Joe Johnston, was Lieutenant Gustavus W. Smith, whose ambitions were to cross the career of Lee 15 years later. George Gordon Meade was also in the topographical detachment and watched with indignation the efforts of Colonel Totten to give the engineers the advantage. I have been pretty much of a spectator for a week, young Meade confided to his wife, the Corps of Engineers having performed all the engineering that has been done. This is attributable to the presence of Colonel Totten, who wishes to make as much capital for his own corps and give us as little as possible. Toward evening, on the 10th of March, General Scott and his staff came ashore. Establishing temporary headquarters in a few tents pitched close to the bowers that the soldiers had erected overnight, Scott and his official family rode around the city. From the distance at which they saw it, Vera Cruz appeared strong and not unimposing. The hillocks of brush-covered sand gave place to level ground as the city was approached. The port was encircled by a curtain wall connecting a line of bastions and redans that seemed to be heavily armed. Prickly pear had been set out between the bastions and a system of trues de loup had been dug in the shifting sand in front of the walls. Beyond the towers of the city, as seen from the land side, rose the castle San Juan de Aloa. It was about 1,000 yards offshore, was protected on three sides by reefs, and had a formidable water battery. In 1838 the French had taken it, and a young American sailor who had watched the bombardment, David G. Farragut by name, had hastened to the fort and had studied its condition. He had concluded that it was vulnerable because shell easily shattered the coral-like limestone of which the place was built.
Scott, however, had been told that the castle had been greatly extended, almost rebuilt and its armament about doubled. He estimated that the garrison of the town numbered about 5,000 and he anticipated no great trouble in taking it, but he was doubtful of his ability to reduce the castle with the siege train then available. Having completed his first reconnaissance, Scott gathered Lee and the other members of his little cabinet about him and raised the question of whether Vera Cruz should be stormed or taken by siege. Descanting at length on the public's demand for a heavy butcher's bill, he declared unequivocally for regular approaches. Somewhat to his surprise, Totten, Lee, and the rest agreed with him. The investment of the city was accordingly ordered, despite the difficulties imposed by lack of transportation for use on the sandy, broken ground. It was foreseen that all the heavy guns had to be dragged by hand from the landing place to the batteries. Owing to a succession of northers, March 12th around before the five miles of the line of investment had been taken up, and it was March 17th before all the entrenching tools had been brought ashore. The next day ground was broken for the batteries. It was one of the busiest times Lee had ever experienced. He had a hand in most of the work of the engineers, who laid off the lines, located the batteries, and directed the preparation of the platforms for the heavy ordnance. With the others he studied the condition of the city walls for General Scott in order to ascertain if they could be utilized for an attack on the castle. This reconnoitering, which was very different from that which he had done under General Wool, sometimes carried him so close to the Mexicans that he was warned of their proximity by the barking of their dogs. The northers blew as though they were the allies of the natives. The sand was insufferable, the food was poor. And then there were the fleas, the unrivaled fleas. I have never seen anything like them, one officer wrote years afterwards. If one were to stand ten minutes in the sand, the fleas would fall upon him in hundreds. How they live in that dry sand, no one knows. They don't live very high, for they are ever ready for a change of diet. The engineer officers, G. W. Smith and McClellan, slept in canvas bags drawn tight about their necks, having previously greased themselves all over with salt pork. On the 19th, Lee very nearly escaped death. From the position of one of the working parties, he started back to the lines, accompanied by Lt. P. G. T. Beauregard, with whom he had to make his way along a narrow path cut through the brush. At a turn in this path, they suddenly saw the figure of an American soldier and heard his challenge, who goes there? Friends, cried Lee. Officers. Beauregard yelled in the same breath. It was too late. The soldier, thinking that the Mexicans were upon him, blazed away with his pistol, straight at Lee, who had no time to dodge or to strike at the man's weapon. The bullet passed between his left arm and his body, singeing his uniform. A deviation of a fraction of an inch in the soldier's aim would have changed some very important chapters in the history of the United States. Naturally enough, word of Lee's close escape reached headquarters. He explained the facts and appealed for leniency toward the offender, but to no purpose. General Scott was furious over the recklessness of the sentinel and demanded that he be punished. General Scott was now ready to open the bombardment, but he had concluded that his army ordnance was not heavy enough, and he had asked the Navy for the loan of six heavy pieces to be used against the walls. Lee was designated to locate these in battery. He picked a position within 700 yards of the Mexican defenses and succeeded in masking it so completely that the enemy was unaware of what was being done. Using details from the various infantry regiments, together with the engineer troops, Lee started to construct a protecting work with sandbags, and at intervals of every two guns he erected a very thick traverse. On March 22, selected detachments of sailors began to drag the guns from the Sacrificios landing to the new naval battery, as it was styled, a distance of about three miles. The guns weighed 6,300 pounds each, and they had to be hauled along winding sandy trails and through a lagoon two feet deep and seven yards wide. The sailors, however, were glad of an opportunity to share in the operation, and they contrived with the aid of some homely trucks to deliver the guns to Lee. Scott, meantime, had grown impatient of delay and had decided to begin the bombardment with the army ordnance. This fire continued for two days and caused much suffering in the city without breaching the walls or silencing the Mexican artillerists. The naval battery would still be needed to deliver the decisive sledge strokes.
As the six guns had come from five different ships, each vessel was permitted to supply a gun crew. These men, with the officers, were sent ashore and were bivouacked in rear of the battery, itching for action. Among them was Lee's brother, Sidney Smith Lee. He had been given the honor of heading the detachment from the Mississippi, which had contributed a 64-pound shell gun to the battery. The naval battery having been ordered to open on the morning of March 24, Lee pushed the construction as rapidly as he could without disclosing the position to the enemy. On the evening of the 23rd, so much work remained to be done that Lee exercised the authority given him by Totten and called on the sailors to help with the parapets. The seamen, who had come from the fleet in the expectation of having a fight, were much disgruntled at the order, and though they went about filling the sandbags and wielding the shovels, they growled so much that their commanding officer, probably Captain John H. Olick, protested to Lee. His men did not want to hide behind dirt, he said, all they asked was that they be allowed to get at the enemy. It was an outrage to employ them in digging ditches, when Lee finished them, the men would not stay behind them. There was nothing left for Lee to do but to show his orders and to keep the sailors at the work despite their complaints. By daylight on the 24th all the sandbags were filled and soon thereafter the last gun was in place. The sailors were sponging it and were trying to get the sand out of it when well-directed shots showed that the battery had been observed by the Mexicans. Orders were at once given to unmask the pieces and to open on the enemy. It was then 10 o'clock, and Captain Lee, who was directing the fire, had his first experience in actual combat. He had been under fire aboard the Pedrita on March 6, but until that moment he had never aimed a weapon at a foe in more than 22 years of military duty. His thought that morning was not of himself or of the novelty of his position. Objective-minded, then as always, he seemed unconscious of personal danger. No matter where I turned, he recorded in a letter home, my eyes reverted to Smith Lee, and I stood by his gun whenever I was not wanted to elsewhere. Oh, I felt awfully, and am at a loss what I should have done had he been cut down before me. I thank God that he was saved. He preserved his usual cheerfulness, and I could see his white teeth through all the smoke and din of the fire. The service from the American battery was terrific and the shells thrown from our battery were constant and regular discharges, so beautiful in their flight and so destructive in their fall. It was awful. My heart bled for the inhabitants. The soldiers I did not care so much for, but it was terrible to think of the women and children. The fire of all the nearby Mexican batteries was quickly concentrated on the sailors. They had all the fighting they cared for, and they were not at all unwilling to take advantage of the shelter they had been loath to provide the previous night. Some of them had the narrowest of escapes. Just in the rear of the guns, to quote a midshipman from the Potomac, a trench had been dug for the powder boys to jump into for shelter. They would run from the magazine a little farther back and wait in the trench until cartridge was wanted. A large shell happening to fall just back of the trench, the order was given to lie down. A powder boy threw himself upon the ground very near the shell, and I saw him eye it anxiously. He then commenced rolling himself toward the trench, and there being a gentle inclination the disturbance of the loose ground caused the shell to roll after him. Finally he rolled into the trench and the shell followed, fortunately not on top of him. No jack-in-the-box ever sprang up with more sprightliness than did that powder monkey. After all the shell did not explode. The sailors cut down the Mexican flag with a fair shot, and twice they silenced a heavy battery known as the Red Fort. They kept up their salvos until four o'clock and then ceased only because their ammunition was exhausted. The Mexican counterfire, which had been well-directed and stubborn, had meantime slackened. The effect of the battery's bombardment of the walls of the town was already apparent. Satisfied with their day's work, but loath to quit the scene of so much excitement, the sails and their officers left the battery at sunset, and other contingents moved in. In the hurry of the relief, Lee was unable to say goodbye to his brother. Nor did he have opportunity of exchanging adieus with Captain Olick, who had protested so hotly against his men being required to dig dirt the previous evening. The captain went back to his ship in order that another officer of the same rank might have the honor of commanding the battery for a day. Not long afterwards Lee met the captain, who seemed to feel that he owed an apology for expressing himself so vehemently against fortification. Well, said he, I reckon you were right.
I suppose the dirt did save some of my boys from being killed or wounded. But I knew that we would have no use for dirt banks on shipboard, that there what we want is clear decks and an open sea. And the fact is, Captain, I don't like this land fighting, anyway. It ain't clean. The men who came from the fleet on the evening of the 24th were as good as those who went back to the ships. One of the newcomers was Raphael Semmes, later the captain of the Alabama in her exploits against federal shipping. Pondering the inhumanity of the bombardment, Semmes spent a sleepless night. In his service afloat and ashore he left a very vivid account of the scene in the battery, the engineers working away at our sandbags, like so many spectres, by the starlight, the sentinel, at a little distance, pacing his solitary round, and the sailors collected in small groups, discoursing, sotto voce. Before daylight on the 25th Lee had the damaged battery prepared for a renewal of the action. The boatswain's mate piped all hands to the guns, and the bombardment was resumed. The enemy responded with spirit. A small Mexican battery directly in front of the naval guns was handled with a special skill, while the castle San Juan de Aloa, partially aroused at last, sent over a few shells at intervals. One of these, from a 13-inch gun, struck the sand some five yards in rear of a naval gun. At about this distance in the rear of each piece, Sums recorded, we had stationed a quarter gunner, with a small copper tank, capable of holding eight or ten charges of powder, each charge weighing about ten pounds. The shell falling near one of these petty officers, he turned, upon hearing a noise behind him, he had not seen the shell fall, and finding a monstrous cannon ball there, as he thought, mechanically put his hand upon it. Finding it hot, it at once occurred to him what it was. It was too late to run, and in the consternation of the moment, he doubled himself up in a heap and attempted to burrow himself, head foremost, in the sand, like an ostrich. All this occurred in the space of a second, and in a moment more the shell exploded, with the noise of a thousand pieces of artillery shaking the battery like an earthquake and covering the officers and men with clouds of dust and sand. Our fire was suspended for a moment, and when the smoke had cleared off sufficiently to enable us to distinguish objects, every officer looked around him in breathless anxiety, expecting to behold the blackened corpses and mutilated bodies of half his comrades at least. Strange to say, not a soul was hurt. Not long after the guns opened for the third day's fire on the morning of March 26, a flag of truce was sent out by the Mexicans through the flying sand of another severe norther. Soon word passed around that the enemy was preparing to surrender. Ere long firing ceased. It was renewed no more at Veracruz, for though the Mexicans rejected Scott's terms, they resumed conference during the forenoon of March 27, and that night signed the capitulation. This provided that the Mexicans should march out with the honors of war, surrender their arms, and be paroled. The city and its armament were to pass into the possession of the United States. The castle, its garrison and its guns were included in the surrender, much to the satisfaction of the Americans, who had not warmed to the prospect of besieging it with the ordnance then available. Released from duty with the naval battery, Lee took the first opportunity of riding again around the walls of the town to observe the effect of the bombardment. Some 2,500 shells had been fired, 1,800 of them from the long cannon of the sailors. The Mexican batteries had been almost demolished, a long stretch of city wall had been reduced to powder, and many houses in the poor district facing the American works had unfortunately been wrecked. Although Lee could not see it at the time, much damage had been done one of the churches, where a shell had penetrated the roof and had exploded among women and children who had taken refuge there. Next came the ceremonies attending the formal surrender of Vera Cruz, in which Lee had no conspicuous part, though he doubtless witnessed the march of the Mexicans on the morning of March 29th to the field where they laid down their arms. It was a smaller force than Scott had thought, for instead of numbering 5,000 men in the city alone, the strength of the troops in Vera Cruz was 3,360, and that of the castle garrison, 1030, a total of 4,390. Some 600 of these had been killed or wounded, according to Mexican accounts, which may have been exaggerated. The American casualties, Army and Navy, were 19 killed and 57 wounded. In appreciation of the part the engineers had in this easy victory, General Scott entrusted his victory dispatch to Colonel Totten and commended him, after the manner of conquerors, to the very favorable consideration of the department. Before Colonel Totten left for Washington, he, in turn, wrote Scott in warm commendation of the other engineers who had been engaged in the siege.
He listed them by seniority and by name, Lee second on the list. Two days later, Lee got his first mention in orders when Scott included him among those who, in Scott's words, were isolated by rank or position as well as by noble services. Lee was cited along with Joseph E. Johnston for having rendered occasional aid in staff work. The distinction Lee gained at Vera Cruz was much greater, in reality, than the orders indicated. Scott's good opinion of him was confirmed. On Totten's departure, he became second-ranking engineer officer of the Army, and from the beginning of the subsequent operations, he seems to have been consulted by the commanding general much more than was Major John L. Smith, the senior engineer, who was in ill health. There followed a few days of comparative inaction, during which Lee managed to prepare his financial statement for the engineer's office. Similar reports were made quarterly during the whole of his service in Mexico, and sometimes they had to be prepared in the midst of action, but not one of them was delayed beyond the due date. On Sunday, April 4, occurred one of the oddest incidents of the occupation. Although the Articles of Capitulation had guaranteed freedom of religious worship to the population of Vera Cruz, some of the local clergy hesitated to open their churches for fear that the American soldiers might profane them. Word of this having reached General Scott, he sent a message to the bishop and asked if he might have the use of two churches, as he had some excellent chaplains in the army. The Mexicans took this to mean that the general desired religious exercises held, and they decided they had better officiate themselves than have the Americans do so. Services were accordingly resumed in all the churches. The Catholic question was a live one in the United States at that time, and even attendance on mass was something of a danger to a man with political ambitions such as Scott cherished, nonetheless he set an example by going to church the next Sunday, accompanied by his staff, all of them in full-dress uniforms. There were no seats in the church, which was situated close to one of the American batteries, but the ecclesiastic promptly placed a bench against the wall for the distinguished worshippers. Lee sat down with the general. Noticing, in the crowd of soldiers around the door, his friend Lt. Henry J. Hunt, who had been in garrison at the Narrows with him, Lee motioned to him to come and take a seat by his side on the bench. After Hunt had joined him the acolytes cleared a way around the church for a procession. Then one of them brought down a large lighted candle from the altar and gave it Scott. The general did not understand what was afoot, but he took the candle and passed it to his aide. The acolyte promptly returned with a smaller taper intended for the aid, and when he saw what had happened, he blew it out, retraced his steps and soon returned with another light, as large as the first, which he placed in the general's hand. This time Scott kept it, though he still did not realize what he was expected to do with it. In a few moments, the other officers were supplied with candles, and all of them were requested to stand up. A side door opened, a company of prelates entered, and before they knew it Scott and his staff were marching in procession around the church. The probable candidate for the presidency of an anti-Catholic country not only was in a Catholic church, but was participating in a Catholic ceremony. It was too much for the risibles of officers who knew the extent both of Scott's ambitions and of the religious prejudices of many American voters. Lee walked as seriously as if he had been on parade at West Point, but soon he felt Hunt touch his elbow. Lee looked reprovingly at his companion, but when Hunt did the same thing again, Lee bent his head and whispered, What is it? Captain Lee, said Hunt. Well, I really hope there is no pussyism in all this, reviving the jest of the religious controversy at Fort Hamilton over the righteous Dr. Pusey. Lee said nothing and continued his march, but, said Hunt, the corners of his eyes and mouth were twitching in the struggle to preserve his gravity. Chapter 15 A Day Under a Log Contributes to Victory Cerro Gordo Less than a week after General Scott's embarrassing experience at church, Lee saw Twig's division of regulars set out from Vera Cruz for the interior. Scott had planned from the first to find and to defeat the main army of the enemy, even if he had to march to Mexico City, and he had tarried at the coast solely because of the slow arrival of transportation. No certain news was available at the time concerning the strength, the movements, or the position of the enemy, though it was reported that General Santa Anna had hurried southward after his defeat at Buena Vista and had organized a new army with which to dispute the advance of the Americans towards his capital. To give Twig support in case these rumors proved true, other units of the army marched inland from day to day until April 12, when General Scott himself left Vera Cruz, accompanied by Lee and the rest of his staff.
The division of Worth and a few detachments remained behind, but were to join the main army as soon as practicable. There still was no definite information of the enemy, but rumor had it that Santa Ana was already at Jalapa, 60 miles northwest of Vera Cruz. Anticipating the advance, Lee took advantage of the final visit to bid farewell to his brother with the fleet. He had spent one night aboard the Mississippi, where the visit had not been altogether a success. He was very well, Lee wrote of Smith, but what a place a ship is to enjoy the company of one's brother. Without more ado he joined his commander. Traveling through rich plains, which delighted the heart of Lee, the cavalcade came on April 14 to the broad and swift, though shallow, Rio del Plan at a bridge leading to a village and a pleasant meadow-styled Plan del Rio. The village was deserted, but the surrounding fields were covered with bowers set up by the advance American column. All the troops that had preceded Scott were there, with Major General Robert Patterson in command. The men received their general-in-chief with loud cheers, but much as he loved it, he had little time for their applause. His subordinates had grave news for him. The enemy had been located, in a grim mountain pass that rose above Rio del Plan, Santa Ana himself, with a force estimated at 12,000 or more, was awaiting the Americans. All the extensive mountain ridges commanding the passes were held by strong Mexican batteries. General Twiggs had wished to attack on the 13th and had planned to do so on the 14th, but had been held back by General Patterson, who did not want an action opened against a position of such strength until Scott himself was on the ground with all his forces. Scott at once ordered a full reconnaissance. Young engineers had been working on the right of the road that led through the pass, and they had some reason to believe that a practicable route for the army might be found there. Lee was directed to press the reconnaissance and to ascertain whether the enemy's position could be turned. Going out on the morning of 15th with his guide, John Fitfit Swalterter, Lee found that Santa Ana had chosen his ground well. The right of the Mexicans overlooked the river, on bluffs so nearly perpendicular that it was manifestly futile to attempt a turning movement there. Back from the river the ground rose fast to three ridges that ran eastward and northeastward toward the position of the United States Army. These ridges were crowned with well-sighted batteries. Just north of the ridge farthest from the river the so-called National Road mounted to the pass. On this thoroughfare, at a high point dominating it for nearly a mile, was still another battery. North of the road and northwest of the ridges rose a conical hill, known as Cerro Gordo. Guns had been placed here and a tower had been erected. North and west of Cerro Gordo the strength and position of the enemy, among the high hills and deep ravines that cut the landscape, were not discoverable by the Americans. Even the course of the road from Cerro Gordo northwestward toward Jalapa had not been ascertained. Roughly sketched, the terrain was assumed to be about this. Manifestly, it was as foolish to deliver the main attack up the National Road as it was to undertake a turning movement along the river. The army's only hope lay in finding a practicable way through the ravines on the Mexican left that had been partially explored. Lee himself stated his problem thus, the right of the Mexican line rested on the river at a perpendicular rock, unscalable by man or beast, and there left on impassable ravines, the main road was defended by field works containing 35 cannon, in their rear was the mountain of Cerro Gordo, surrounded by entrenchments in which were cannon and crowned by a tower overlooking all. It was around this army that it was intended to lead our troops. Slowly Lee worked his way up the ravines north of the river, on the Mexican left. The ground was very difficult, but to Lee it did not seem altogether impossible to construct a road over which troops might advance with proper caution. At last Lee stopped his stealthy movements to look about him. Near at hand was a spring, to which a path led from the south. This path must have been well trampled, and the bushes around it must have been broken, for Lee at once concluded that he was in rear of the Mexican left flank. As he waited and studied the ground he heard voices and conversation in Spanish. Pausing only a moment he got a glimpse of a group of Mexican soldiers coming toward the spring. What should he do? How could he escape? There was only an instant for reflection, then silently he dropped down behind a great log close to the water. Fortunately, the undergrowth was so thick by the side of the log that it formed a screen. Louder the voices, louder, too, the sound of men making their way along the path. 
Soon the soldiers halted at the spring, drank deeply and paused in the shade to talk of the Yankees that were gathering under the ridge. If one of those Mexicans should chance to see the print of an American boot in the soft earth and should grow inquisitive, then it would be a quick death for Captain Lee and for Fitzwater who was hidden nearby. There would be surprise at headquarters because of Lee's non-return, and, to end all, there would be weeping at Arlington when the news came that he had gone off on reconnaissance and had never been heard of again. Quietly Lee lay under the log, not daring to move a muscle. Soon more soldiers arrived and some of those who had first come to the spring straggled back. Was it to be so all day? Was the spring the water supply for that wing of the army? If so, then there could be no hope of escaping detection. Someone surely would begin to poke about among the bushes. Down on the log sat a Mexican, down sat another. Their backs were not three feet from Lee. At last they got up and lazily went their way. But others came and still others and began to prowl around as they chattered one to another. There was a momentary shadow and a Mexican stepped over the log almost on Lee. Had he slipped he would have landed squarely on the flank of the engineer. There was no prospect that all of them would go away. Lee could only pray that they would not see him. The shadows slipped and the drowsy afternoon came. Rigid and silent, scarcely daring to breathe, Lee hugged the damp bark of the fallen tree and let the insects crawl and bite unhindered. Hours passed, hours that seemed ages, while that endless procession of thirsty soldiers came and drank and loafed. At last the air grew cooler, the shade began to blur. It was twilight. The Mexicans were less numerous. Finally, they ceased to come and the last loiterer shuffled off. Silence then and tropical blackness. Not another sound on the path, only the distant buzz of voices around far-off campfires. Slowly Lee lifted his stiff joints from his refuge and slipped out. He was safe. Satan himself could not have seen in that blackness. And now to find the way down that treacherous ravine back to the American lines. Well it was that Lee as a boy had prowled about King George's meadows around quiet old Alexandria and had developed his sense of direction. Running now into a tree, slipping here down the side of the ravine, peering at every little watercourse to see which way it flowed and feeling at every step to discover the nature of the ground, he at last reached headquarters. He reported his findings, but he was by no means satisfied with them. Major Smith had also been out that day and had reached the same conclusion as Lee, but he, too, was still in some doubt whether the army could maneuver around the Mexican left. Scott directed them to continue the reconnaissance the next day and he placed at Lee's disposal a working party with which to cut a trail. Lee accordingly went out on the 16th and before nightfall had pushed his reconnaissance much farther. He did not reach the Jalapa Road, which the Americans must occupy if they were to cut off the Mexican retreat, but he was reasonably sure that he was close to it. The new trail up the ravine was passable by the close of day, thanks to the efforts of the pioneer troops. A decision had now to be reached, either the army must remain in the valley, exposed to yellow fever, which was expected to appear very soon, or else Scott had to attack at once, and if he attempted to drive the Mexicans from their perches he must deliver his main assault around the enemy's left flank, in the direction of Lee's and Smith's reconnaissance. There was no alternative. True, the route on the Mexican left was exposed at one point to the fire of the enemy, true, also, the distance to the Jalapa Road, from the farthest point that Lee had reached, might be an upsetting factor. But Lee believed the Jalapa Road was close to Cerro Gordo, and Scott thought the risks were justified. When Lee and other engineers had reported, Scott decided to send Twiggs's division around Santa Ana's flank the next day, April 17, with Lee as guide. The battle was not to be opened until the second day following, April 18, as Scott desired to have the aid of Worth, who was nearing Plan del Rio with some 1,600 men and a part of the siege train. As reveille was sounded for Twiggs's division, at 4.30 on the morning of April 17, there opened for Lee two days of the heaviest responsibility he had ever known. He left before Scott's order for the battle had been issued, but he doubtless knew all that was contemplated. General Gideon Pillow was to make a demonstration on the 18th, along the left of the American line, opposite the three batteries on the ridges, though it was not considered likely that his volunteers could storm such formidable positions. 
the troops in the center, along the National Road, would have to wait until the flanking movement had forced the enemy from the commanding batteries, everything depended on Twiggs's division, which depended on Lee. If he led the troops into a slaughter pen in the mountains, the blame would be wholly his. The mission of Twiggs's division was explicit, that afternoon, April 17, it was to occupy the approaches to Cerro Gordo, particularly the hill Atalea, which was somewhat lower than Cerro Gordo and lay about one-third of a mile northeast of it. This having been done, Twiggs's soldiers were to storm Cerro Gordo the next morning and were to press on until they blocked the Jalapa Road. The other troops would then complete the envelopment of the Mexican forces. With the greatest vigilance, Lee carried the men up the ravines that led around Santa Ana's left. We moved very slowly, one participant recorded, every now and then halting half an hour or so, while the rifle regiment, as skirmishers, cautiously felt the way through the chaparral in advance. Lee was with the van, General Twiggs was close by. As the column approached the Mexican position absolute silence was enjoined on the men. Suddenly there was a thud and a rattle. Men stiffened themselves to the alert, only to discover that the commotion had been caused by a soldier who had slipped on a loose stone and, in trying to recover his balance, had struck his musket against his canteen. Instantly the man's captain was upon him, sword in hand, you infernal scoundrel, he roared at the top of his lungs, I'll run you through if you don't make less noise. The spectacle of the captain brandishing his blade and the poor example of silence that he gave his company set the column laughing. The tension of the toiling line was eased, and the advance continued. About eleven o'clock, when the column was within seven hundred yards of the enemy, a company of the 7th Infantry was sent up a hill separated by a ravine from the higher hill of Atalea in order to observe the movements of the Mexicans prior to an attack against Atalea itself. The infantrymen soon found that a Mexican force from the direction of Atalea was advancing against them in greatly superior numbers. A clash followed in a few minutes, and as it was apparent that his movement was now discovered, Twiggs ordered two regiments forward to support the men of the 7th Infantry and then to advance on Atalea. Word was passed quickly. The excited soldiers formed line of battle. Just before the command was given them to go forward, one of the captains approached General Twiggs. I beg pardon, General, he said, how far shall we charge them? Charge them to hell, Twiggs stoutly replied. The 1st Artillery and the Rifle Regiment sprang up the hillside, quickly relieved the men of the 7th Infantry, swept the Mexicans down the nearer hill, up Atalea, over its crest, through a ravine, and had started up the sides of Cerro Gordo in hot pursuit before they heeded the recall. Then some of them found they could not return to their lines under the fire the Mexicans were pouring into the side of Atalea from Cerro Gordo. There was danger, for the time being, that the vanguard would be taken prisoner by a Mexican counterattack, but this was prevented by the fire of some light guns, hurriedly pulled to the top of Atalea. After nightfall, the venturesome vanguard returned to Atalea, and such of the men as were not designated for special duty threw themselves on the ground and went to sleep. There was no rest for Lee, however. He felt that thus far all had gone flawlessly. The troops were in an advantageous position with only a few casualties. But as the attack on Cerro Gordo the next morning promised to be a more serious affair, Lee had two special duties to perform, first to locate a battery on Atalea, and then to see that the heavy guns, which were being painfully brought forward, were in position and ready to open at sunrise. Fortunately, three volunteer regiments of Shields Brigade had arrived on Twiggs's line at about five o'clock, and as these troops were much fresher than the regulars, they were at once put to work, under Lee's direction, hauling the heavy pieces up the hill and putting them in place. Before daylight on the 18th, all was ready. Twiggs had consulted Lee freely on the 17th and had taken his advice with assurance. He doubtless sought Lee's counsel that night on the assignment of troops for the bloody task of the morrow. At Scott's suggestion, it was decided that a part of the division was to assault Cerro Gordo as soon as the artillery opened. Simultaneously, Lee was to conduct the men of another brigade around the northern flank of Cerro Gordo and was to lead them to the supposed location of the Jalapa Road so that they could cut off the enemy's retreat as provided in the general plan of action. Shields' brigade was to follow on this route with the same objective. Early in the morning of the 18th Lee set out with Colonel Bennett Riley, commander of the 2nd Brigade, who was to be in charge of the turning movement.
About the same time fire was opened by the three guns Lee had placed on the summit of Atalea, and the direct assault on Cerro Gordo began under the eye of General Scott, who had ridden out to witness it. Lee saw little of this assault. The column he was conducting had not gone far before it came under raking gunfire from the northern and western sides of Cerro Gordo. Part of the command had to be turned to the left to protect that flank. With the remainder, Lee kept on. As he plowed his way through the fire, his thoughts turned homeward to Custis, and he found himself wondering where he could have put the boy to ensure his safety if the lad had been with him. Very soon General Shields was ordered to swing around and take position to the west of Riley's division. With the left regiment scrambling along the sides of Cerro Gordo, the United Force turned south to meet the troops that had swept over the crest. Riley's troops had become somewhat scattered during the advance, and while they were being reformed for a charge on a five-gun battery on the Jalapa Road, southwest of Cerro Gordo, Lee paused to help collect the Mexican wounded. Close to a little hut, he came upon a Mexican boy, a drummer or a bugler, lying with a shattered arm under a dying soldier. Nearby was a little girl, probably from the hut, who was tormented by the plight of the boy, but unable to help him. Her large black eyes were streaming with tears, Lee remembered, her hands crossed over her breast, her hair in one long plate behind reached her waist, her shoulders and arms bare, and without stockings or shoes. Her plaintive tone of mil gracias, senor, as I had the dying man lifted of the boy and both carried to the hospital still lingers in my ear. Breaking his way towards Cerro Gordo through the chaparral, Lee mounted Creole and soon rejoined the infantrymen, who were now ready to attack the five-gun battery. They were met with only light fire as they dashed forward. A few minutes more, and the troops of Riley and Shields were across the Jalapa Road, which was found as close to Cerro Gordo as Scott and Lee had expected it would be. This turning movement can be seen at a glance from the sketch on the next page. While this operation had been in progress, the attack on Cerro Gordo had been proceeding with equal success. The entire center and left of the Mexican position was occupied, and the right of Santa Ana's army, near the river, was cut off from retreat, though General Pillow's attack along the Rio del Plan was a failure. The Mexicans on the right speedily surrendered, and Patterson's division in the center, finding the pass clear, undertook to pursue the enemy up the Jalapa Road. In this pursuit, Twiggs's division and Shields' brigade also had a part. Before nightfall, the remnants of the enemy were driven ten miles and were broken into small detachments. Approximately 3,000 troops were captured, together with thousands of small arms and most of the Mexican artillery. Santa Ana himself barely escaped, on muleback, leaving his carriage, his headquarters equipment, his correspondence and his money chest to fall into the hands of the Americans. His forces, it subsequently developed, numbered about 8,000, while Scott had 9,000. The Mexican losses, which were never officially reported, must have run to hundreds. Those of the United States Army, April 1718, were 263 killed and 368 wounded. Lee came out of the action at Cerro Gordo, which was his first open engagement, with a new realization of the hideousness of war. He wrote Custis, you have no idea what a horrible sight a field of battle is. But if there could be glory for any individual in so much misery, it came to Lee from Cerro Gordo. He, a captain of engineers, had been one of the two officers to find the route on which the plan of battle had been based, and he had successfully led the turning column on both days. His reasoning as to the position of the enemy and the location of the Jalapa Road had been correct. He had disclosed a special aptitude for reconnaissance, and by the possession of this quality he was commended anew to Scott, who leaned more and more heavily on him. When the reports came in, Lee was mentioned in the warmest terms by each of the commanders under whom he had served. Colonel Riley said of him, Although not appropriately within the range of this report, yet coming under my immediate observation, I cannot refrain from bearing testimony to the intrepid coolness and gallantry exhibited by Captain Lee, United States Engineers, when conducting the advance of my brigade under the heavy flank fire of the enemy. General Twiggs began a separate paragraph of his report to declare, Although whatever I may say may add little to the good reputation of Captain Lee, of the Engineer Corps, yet I may indulge in the pleasure of speaking of the invaluable services which he rendered me from the time I left the main road, until he conducted Colonel Riley's brigade to its position in rear of the enemy's strong work on the Jalapa Road.
I consulted him with confidence and adopted his suggestions with entire assurance. His gallantry and good conduct on both days deserve the highest praise. General Scott mentioned Lee twice in the body of his report and outdid his lieutenants in this studied tribute. In expressing my indebtedness for able assistance to Lt. Col. Hitchcock, Acting Inspector General, to Major Smith and Trumbull, the respective Chiefs of Engineers and Topographical Engineers, to their assistants, Lt. Mason, Beauregard, Stevens, Tower, G. W. Smith, McClellan, Engineers, and Lt. Derby and Hardcastle, Topographical Engineers, to Capt. Allen. Chief Quartermaster, and Lt. Blair, Chief Commissary, and to Lt. Hayner and Laidley, Ordnance. All actively employed, I am impelled to make special mention of the services of Capt. R. E. Lee, Engineers. This officer, greatly distinguished at the Siege of Vera Cruz, was again indefatigable, during these operations, in reconnaissance as daring as laborious, and of the utmost value. Nor was he less conspicuous in planting batteries and in conducting columns to their stations under the heavy fire of the enemy. No other officer of the army received such high praise, none gained so much in prestige by the action. Captain Robert Anderson believed Lee to be the man best qualified by participation to write a history of the battle. On August 24, though he did not get the news till much later, Lee was brevetted major, to date from April 18, 1847, for gallant and meritorious conduct in the Battle of Cerro Gordo. Opportunity had come in his first battle, he had made the most of it. Chapter 16, Laurels in a Lava Field Padierna and Churubusco With the vanguard of the troops that followed the defeated Mexicans, Lee entered the city of Jalapa on April 19. It was a pleasant place of some 5,000 people and had an elevation of about 4,500 feet. From Jalapa he hurried on to Perot, which General Worth took without opposition. There Lee helped to verify an inventory of the arms and ammunition in the old castle. It was a tedious task, though performed in an ancient building that greatly interested Lee. During the intervals of work he found opportunity for reflection and prayer, I endeavored to give thanks to our Heavenly Father for all his mercies to me, for his preservation of me through all the dangers I have passed, and, for, all the blessings which he has bestowed upon me, for I know I fall far short of my obligations, thus he wrote Mrs. Lee on the 25th, after attending his service in the courtyard. A few days later he rejoined Scott, who had established himself in the governor's palace at Jalapa. Despite the recent victory the atmosphere of headquarters was not happy. Transportation was still far below the army's needs, there was no news of the arrival of reinforcements at Vera Cruz, the term of several thousand of the volunteers was about to expire, and they showed no disposition to re-enlist, Scott's suspicious nature led him to believe that the administration was withholding support at a time when he was sure that he could lead, with negligible losses, a properly equipped army straight to Mexico City. His apprehensions were intensified by the arrival early in May of Nicholas P. Trist, chief clerk of the State Department, who was sent to conduct preliminaries of peace, without previous intimation to Scott either of his coming or of the nature of his mission. Both Scott and Trist lost their temper in an undignified exchange of letters before they reached an understanding. While Scott and Trist were firing long letters at each other, old fuss and feathers sent Worth forward to Puebla, which was entered on May 15, after a brush the previous afternoon with the enemy's cavalry. Puebla is about 120 miles southwest of Jalapa, by the route Worth followed, and was at that time the second city of Mexico in population. It lay 186 miles from Veracruz and 93 miles, as the roads then ran, from Mexico City. Santa Ana's failure to defend so important a place could only mean that since the Battle of Cerro Gordo he had not been able to collect an army capable of putting up a fight. Scott accordingly moved his headquarters forward, and on May 28 entered Puebla with his staff, Lee among them. Here occurred another long period of delay and dark misgivings while Scott waited for reinforcements. He saw to it that his troops were occupied with hard drilling, and he held nightly levies to amuse and to instruct his officers. Touchy, pompous, and vainglorious though he might be, Scott nonetheless was the most scientific soldier at that time in America, and around his supper table he discussed for two or three hours with the heads of the various divisions of the general staff the particular problem that then confronted the army, whether of transport, supply, drill, gunfire, or march. If no military matter pressed, he talked of other things, for his reading was wide and his culture was real.
These evening conferences were a very material part of the military education of Robert Lee. Equally instructive was his special duty. For Scott directed him and Major William Turnbull, chief topographical engineer, to make separate studies of the approaches to the city of Mexico and to prepare a map. Each collected what data he could from travelers and natives and penciled these on his map. When this information was verified, it was inked in. The result was a map of substantial accuracy, though faulty in many details. Scott examined the engineer's progress almost daily and especially desired them to make full investigation of the roads leading into Mexico City from the south, beyond Lake Chalco, as it was soon apparent that a direct advance on the city from the east, by the main road, if not impracticable, would be very difficult. On August 7, Franklin Pierce arrived at Puebla with a second contingent of reinforcements, 2,500 in number. The American force now numbered 10,738 officers and men, organized as follows. Harney's Cavalry Brigade, detachments of the 1st, 2D, and 3D Dragoons. 1st, Worth's, Division. 1st, Garland's, Brigade, 2D and 3D Artillery, Dismounted, 4th Infantry, Duncan's Battery. 2nd, Clark's, Brigade, 5th, 6th, and 8th Infantry, 1 Battery. 2nd, Twiggs's, Division. 1st, Smith's, Brigade, 1st Artillery, Dismounted, 3D Infantry, Rifle Regiment, Taylor's Battery. 2nd, Riley's, Brigade, 4th Artillery, Dismounted, 1st and 7th Infantry. 3rd, Pillows, Division. 1st, Cadwallader's, Brigade, Voltiger Regiment, 11th and 14th Infantry, Light Battery. 4th, Quitman's, Division. 1st, Shields, Brigade, New York Volunteers, 1 Regiment, South Carolina Volunteers, 1 Regiment. 2nd, Watson's, Brigade, Detachment 2D Pennsylvania Volunteers, Detachment U.S. Marines. The size of this force led Scott to determine, with the greatest boldness, to abandon his line of communications and to undertake to live off the country while he pursued, found, and destroyed his adversary. The very morning after Pierce reported, Scott put Twiggs's division on the road to Mexico City. It was his belief that Santa Ana must make a stand to save his capital, but where he would give battle, and in what strength, Scott did not pretend to know. Slowly, on August 10, the army crawled up the Rio Frio Range, the great natural barrier to an attack on Mexico City from the east. As the column started down the western slope Lee got his first glimpses of the Great Valley of Mexico, shining and verdant, spangled with white villages and girdled with mountains. Mexico City itself, with frowning walls and defiant towers, was plainly visible through glasses. Recovering from the sublime trance, Scott wrote, Probably, not a man in the column failed to say to his neighbor or himself, that splendid city soon shall be ours. The sentiment of the average soldier, gazing downward on the plain, could not have been very different from that of Cortez and his conquistadores, 328 years earlier. Some earthworks were found on the mountains, but these had been abandoned before they had been finished. No enemy was encountered until after the army had reached Ayotla, the last town on the road to Mexico. Here, on August 11, Scott established headquarters. To the west of Ayotla the road to Mexico, which was 19 miles distant, was known to run on a narrow causeway through marshes, between Lake Texcoco on the north and Lake Xochimilco and Chalco on the south. The most casual examination of this ground showed that it was as strongly occupied and fortified as Lee had been told it was when he was making his map at Puebla. Could the army assault the enemy's position or turn it successfully between the lakes? That was the question Lee was sent out on the 12th and 13th to answer. By evening on the second day he was able to report in some detail. His own description of the obstacles, written nine days later, was as follows. The enemy's principal defense was at El Penin, commanding the causeway. The hill of El Penin is about 300 feet high, having three plateaus of different elevations. It stands in the waters of Lake Tezcuco, Texcoco. Its base is surrounded by a dry trench, and its sides arranged with breastworks from its base to its crest. It was armed with 30 pieces of cannon and defended by 700 men under Santa Ana in person.
The causeway passed directly by its base, the waters of the lake washing each side of the causeway for two miles in front and the whole distance, seven miles, to the city. There was a battery on the causeway, and 400 yards in advance of the pennon, another by its side, a third a mile in front of the entrance to the city, and a fourth at the entrance. About two miles in front of the pennon a road branched off to the left and crossed the outlet of Lake Hacamilico, Zachimilco, at the village of Mexicalcingo, six miles from the main road. This village, surrounded by a marsh, was enveloped in batteries and only approached over a paved causeway, a mile in length, beyond, the causeway continued through the marsh for two miles further and opened upon terra firma at the village of Churubusco. Scott believed that he could storm the pennon, but he knew it would cost him many lives and he wished to conserve his force for the major battle he felt sure he later would have to wage before he could enter Mexico. The route by Mexicalcingo, though difficult, was less so than the other. Scott accordingly decided tentatively to mask El Pennon and to turn the enemy's positions via Mexicalcingo. Before this could be undertaken, word came from General Worth that some of his officers had returned from a reconnaissance made at Scott's order. They were convinced that the army could move around the lower end of Lake Chalco and could advance on Mexico from the south, avoiding all the works between the lakes. Scott had considered this line of approach while he was at Puebla, but had never reached a final decision regarding it. Now his problem, shown on page 254, was clearer. The reconnaissance to the south of Chalco had not been complete and some of the inferences drawn from it were to prove erroneous. Nonetheless, an advance in that direction offered so much the better chance of avoiding heavy losses that Scott promptly gave orders for the army to take the road around Chalco, leaving one division temporarily in front of Ayotla to delay the enemy. The distance from Ayotla to San Agustin, on the road from Acapulco to Mexico City, was estimated to be 27 miles. While the army was slowly plodding around the eastern shore of Lake Chalco, which was more a marsh than a lake, Lee went ahead on the 17th and made a reconnaissance of the roads to the south and west of Chalco. On his return to Oclamilco, where General Scott had stopped for the night with Pillow's division, Lee reported the facts and confirmed Scott in his purpose to advance on San Augustine. However, Scott did not deceive himself. He knew he would not have the element of surprise on his side because he was sure the movements of his army had been observed and reported to Santa Ana. Consequently, he expected to encounter the whole of the Mexican army in the vicinity of San Augustine. Advancing steadily on that village he met with no opposition, but when he arrived there on the morning of August 18, he received a message from General Twiggs that made him even more certain that a battle was imminent. For Twiggs reported that as he had marched away from Ayotla on the 16th with the rear division, he had encountered and had exchanged shots with a large force of Mexican cavalry who must have discovered that the whole American army was moving to the south of Lake Chalco. First reconnaissances showed singularly difficult terrain around San Augustine. The Acapulco road to Mexico City led northward to a hacienda known as San Antonio, distant about three miles. Although quite practicable for the wagon train and the artillery, this highway was swept for a long distance by gunfire from San Antonio, which was found to be heavily fortified. It was not possible to avoid this road by marching to the east of it, because though the ground was so soft that wheeled vehicles would be mired. Nor did it seem possible to turn San Antonio from the west, because the most conspicuous feature of the landscape was on that side, a great field of lava, more than five miles wide on its east and west axis and three miles long, from north to south, broken into great blocks and fissures, a hopeless barrier to the advance of the guns or the trains. Such a tract of volcanic scoria was known locally as Pedregal and bore an evil name. Furthermore, even if a way for the infantry could be found through the Pedregal, so that they could turn San Antonio without artillery support, their advance would be halted in another two miles at the town and river Churubusco, which had not been reconnoitered but were believed to be heavily fortified. In short, an advance up the Acapulco Road seemed an almost hopeless undertaking. What was to be done, what alternative offered? Only one, about two miles west of San Augustine, the San Angel Road was known to run. This led in a northeasterly direction to Churubusco, where it joined the Acapulco-Mexico City Highway. If a passage could be made from San Augustine to the San Angel Road, then San Antonio could be turned and perhaps no battle would have to be fought till Churubusco was reached. The situation, graphically represented, was thus as shown on page 257.
Before he had been many hours at St. Augustine, Scott did the sensible, obvious thing, he determined to ascertain by accurate reconnaissances whether the direct road northward toward Mexico City by San Antonio was as difficult as had been reported, and, secondly, whether a route could be opened across the Pedregal to the San Angel Road. On the first mission he sent Captain James L. Mason with an escort to the important task of finding if there was a way over the Pedregal he assigned Lee, accompanied by the 11th Infantry and two companies of dragoons. The latter were under command of Captain Phil Kearney, whose dead body Lee was one day to send across the lines in northern Virginia. Lee soon found a road that led over some mounds to the west of San Augustine and then followed the edge of the Pedregal. It was no boulevard, to be sure, but it was passable for infantry and within some work it could be made practicable for artillery. For nearly three miles he made his way westward until he reached the site of an eminence in the Pedregal, known as Zacatepec. There his escort encountered a strong Mexican force, which exchanged shots and then fell back toward the western edge of the Pedregal. The Americans pursued for a short distance and took five prisoners, but as they were unfamiliar with the trail through the lava, they soon abandoned the chase. Lee climbed to the top of Zacatepec and from that height was able to see that the enemy was in strength on the San Angel Road and had thrown up a fortification on a hill near the village of Paterna. This settlement, which the Americans mistook for the village of Contreras, lay almost due west from the route Scott's troops were following. Lee's long-range examination convinced him that this position could be occupied without great loss. Unable to go farther that day, Lee returned to San Augustine. The immediate conclusion to be drawn from his reconnaissance was plain, the Mexicans he had encountered manifestly had come from the San Angel Road, if they could cross the western part of the Pedregal Scots men could too. When they reached the other side of the lava field, they would be on the San Angel Road and could avoid San Antonio altogether. Lee's judgment that this was the best strategy was confirmed in his mind by the news that the reconnaissance up the Acapulco Road had been halted by fire from the Hacienda of San Antonio, where the Mexicans were on the alert and were as strongly fortified as had been reported. That night, Lee attended a council of war, summoned by the commanding general. Scott went over the reports one by one, beginning with the senior officer. Mason, who had reconnoitered on the Acapulco Road, was all for assaulting San Antonio with the bayonet and was convinced that infantry could take the place by a flank movement a short distance into the Pedregal on the western side of the Acapulco Road. Lee argued that the advance could be made with fewer casualties by moving through the Pedregal and up the San Angel Road. A silent auditor, Lt. Raphael Semmes, of the Navy, was much impressed by both engineers. The services of Captain Lee, he attested, were invaluable to his chief. Endowed with a mind which has no superior in his corps and possessing great energy of character, he examined, counseled, and advised with a judgment, tact, and discretion worthy of all praise. His talent for topography was peculiar, and he seemed to receive impressions intuitively, which it cost other men much labor to acquire. Mason, though a very young man, was scarcely, if at all, his inferior in this respect. General Scott gave no final orders before the council broke up, wisely waiting on developments, but he virtually decided to deliver his main attack by way of the San Angel Road. Lee was instructed to start early the next morning with the engineer company and 500 men from Pillow's division to put the track across the Pedregal in condition for artillery. The rest of Pillow's troops and the whole of Twiggs's division were to protect the road builders. The other commands were to remain that day around San Augustine. Formal orders to this effect were issued before the night was over. Never, perhaps, in American history did a force of such limited numbers include so many men of future eminence as the column that filed westward from San Augustine on the morning of August 19. Twigs and Pillow, the commanders, are now mere names, but some of their subordinates will long be remembered. Lee was in general charge of the reconnaissance, Lt. P. G. T. Beauregard was one of his assistants. Lt. G. B. McClellan of the Engineer Company was there with his captain, Gustavus W. Smith, who was subsequently a major general in the Confederate armies. Captain Joseph Hooker was assistant adjutant general to General Pillow. One of the two light batteries that accompanied the infantry was commanded by J. Bankhead Magruder, who, in the early spring of 1862, opposed McClellan on the peninsula of Virginia. Magruder's lieutenant was an awkward young man who had been transferred from the dismounted 1st Artillery when Magruder had received his guns. 
That morning, perhaps for the first time, Lee saw this quiet Mr. Jackson who was to be his own most trusted lieutenant fifteen years thereafter, the Stonewall of the Army of Northern Virginia. Under the direction of these men the troops slowly advanced, covering the working party engaged in the difficult work of turning a mule path into a road fit for artillery and wagons. By 1 p.m. on August 19, the road had been constructed to a point within range of the fortified position of Paderna, which was believed to be under command of General Valencia. The place was found to be armed with 22 guns, most of them heavy. Lee saw that the roadmaking could go no farther till Valencia was driven off. He so reported to General Twiggs, returned the working parties to their regiments, and ordered the engineering tools repacked. General Twiggs thereupon directed Captain John McClellan of the Topographical Engineers and Lieutenant George B. McClellan of the Engineer Company to go forward and find a location for the two American batteries. These officers, however, soon encountered a Mexican picket line and were forced to return. A regiment was then advanced, and the enemy was driven back. Lee accompanied these troops, who halted on the edge of a ravine, thirty yards from the Mexicans. Lee next selected a position for the batteries on the most favorable ground he could find, sheltered somewhat from the enemy, with the wagon safe from the Mexican fire. The batteries, brought up with much difficulty, began a cannonade with the enemy on most uneven terms. While Lee stood with the artillerists, a solid shot took off the leg of Preston Johnston, nephew of his friend Joseph E. Johnston. The boy dropped by the side of the gun and died that night. The ravine that lay between the American troops and the Mexican position was deep and rough and was coursed by a rapid stream that flowed northward. Swept by the Mexican fire, the declivity was considered impassable. Some expedient other than a frontal assault had to be found, and speedily. If this were not discovered, the American batteries would be destroyed and the opportunity lost because Mexican reinforcements could already be seen advancing down the San Angel Road in great numbers. The alternative quickly suggested itself. Almost at the same hour, several of the commanding officers near the front realized that the best movement was to attempt to turn the enemy's left by advancing through the Pedregal and westward across the San Angel Road. Such a maneuver, if successful, would force the enemy from his high ground and, at the same time, would cut him off from a retreat to Mexico City. General Pillow ordered Riley's brigade to start the operation, and close behind Riley he sent Cadwallader. A little later General Persifor F. Smith, of Twig's division, who had been on the left of Magruder's battery, filed away by the right flank, on his own initiative, and followed virtually the same route as Riley and Cadwallader. All these troops, and a few others that General Scott sent on their heels, got safely across the Pedregal and beyond the San Angel Road. Though they found themselves, some 3,300 strong, in a situation full of advantage but, potentially, full of danger as well. They were in and around the little Indian village of San Geronimo, on a high ridge that ran from southwest to northeast between two ravines. Half a mile south of them was the Mexican position they had set out to turn. The approach to it was across a ravine and up a hill, through orchards, standing corn, and thick underbrush. North of the Americans, and on the same side of the road with them another force of Mexicans was observed less than a mile away, mustered on elevated ground. This force consisted of all arms of the service and seemed to be preparing to advance. Estimates of its strength ran as high as 12,000. The Americans, in a word, were between two forces. If they could hold off the northern column they could keep it from reinforcing the Mexicans to the south of them and then they might be able to deliver the intended attack on Paderna from the rear. But if the Mexicans discovered the real situation and were good enough soldiers to make a simultaneous attack from the north and from the south, the Americans might be wiped out. Roughly sketched, the situation was that shown on page 262. General Persifor F. Smith, who believed himself the senior officer on the west side of the San Angel Road, at once prepared to attack the large body of Mexican reinforcements to the north of his position, but before he could get his scattered troops deployed, night overtook him and a heavy cold rain began to descend. The troops had no shelter and little firewood. Contact with the reserves on the eastern side of the road was uncertain, from Scott's headquarters the column was completely cut off by distance, darkness, and the nature of the ground. Lee had come across the San Angel early in the evening, at the instance of General Scott, who was then at Zacatepec.
Lee probably knew that the general believed it possible for the Americans west of the San Angel Road to hold off the Mexican forces north of them while driving the other Mexican troops from the entrenched position at Paterna. Scott, indeed, had been much pleased with the prospect that the occupation of San Geronimo would prevent the reinforcement of Paterna. He had not been especially alarmed to find his advanced column between two Mexican forces. To strengthen the hold on San Geronimo, he had sent Shield's brigade forward, unknown to Smith. But while Lee may have known this to be Scott's estimate of the situation, he brought no orders when he reported to General Smith. After sundown, General Smith called Lee to confer with him and General Cadwallader. Two of the engineers had been up the ravine to the south of San Geronimo and had found it unguarded. The occupants of the work at Paterna evidently were still of the belief that the Americans could and would attack only from the front. On the basis of this information a decision was reached to deliver an attack on Paterna from the rear, before daybreak, disregarding for the time the reinforcements to the north of San Geronimo. The opinion of these officers, it would seem, was that the Mexicans were poor fighters and that, if the troops at Paterna were routed quickly, the others would not stand, much less attempt a counterstroke. To cover the attack on Paterna, a strong demonstration by the troops in front of that place was desirable. But how was it to be assured? The forces west of the San Angel Road were by this time wholly separated from those in the Pedregal, the blackness of the night was unrelieved except by occasional flashes of lightning, a torrential rain was falling, the way across the Pedregal was difficult and dangerous. But as soon as Smith stated that he would like to communicate his plan and position to Scott, Lee volunteered to carry the message to the commanding general, whom he believed to be still at Zacatepec. Smith accepted the offer. The understanding was, however, that Smith would deliver his attack, whether Lee returned from Scott or not. It was near eight o'clock when Lee left San Geronimo with a few men and started down the hill toward the Pedregal. He had been over that part of the route only once, and it was too densely dark for him to observe any of the landmarks. There was nothing to guide him but his singularly developed sense of direction and an occasional glimpse of the hill of Zacatepec when the lightning flashed. Groping his way along, step by step, he reached the road and crossed it in safety. Next, at some point in that black maze, he did not know exactly where, he must find the American outposts and risk being shot before he could give the countersign. Ere long, above the roar of rain, he heard the slow, uncertain tramp of a large body of men. From the direction of their advance, they must be Americans, but what if they were not? Doubtless Lee stepped aside and waited until they were close enough for the next flash of lightning to show their uniforms. A crash of thunder, a ghostly glare for an instant, and he recognized them. They were Shields' men moving to join Smith. Leaving one of his companions to guide these troops to San Geronimo, Lee plunged into the Pedregal. Around great blocks of lava he felt his way, and across crevasses he was forced to jump in the dark. When the lightning showed an abysm over which he could not spring, he had to skirt it, with every risk of losing his direction. There were fully three tortuous miles of this, in unrelieved night. At last, drenched and sore, Lee stumbled to Zacatepec only to find that Scott had returned to San Augustine. What should he do? Stay there till daylight and let Smith make his attack without the desired demonstration in his front? Not so long as the blood of Light Horse Harry flowed in the veins of his son. Tired legs and bruised feet would have to carry him three miles more through the Pedregal. So, on he went, gratified for every pickstroke that had taken the edge from any of that accursed lava on trail where the pioneers had labored to make a road. Three miles must have seemed thirty, and Lee's strong body was close to exhaustion when finally he saw dim lights in the houses at San Augustine. Still wet from the rain, every muscle numb and aching, Lee stepped into Scott's headquarters at eleven o'clock. He found the general calmly writing his report of the day's operations, confident of the outcome but naturally anxious for news from the other side of the Pedregal. No information had come during the evening. Seven officers whom Scott had sent out in turn to carry messages to General Smith had all returned without reaching him. The commander listened admiringly to Lee's report, cordially approved Smith's dispositions, and prepared immediately to order the desired demonstration against the front of the Mexican position at Paterna. He decided also to send part of Worth's division forward in case it should be needed.
Before the orders could be given two other callers were announced, General Twiggs and General Pillow. These division commanders had started from Zacatepec for San Geronimo during the evening but had lost their way and had barely escaped falling into the hands of the enemy. Twiggs had injured his foot and the two had been forced to retrace their steps to Zacatepec and thence, finding Scott gone, they had followed to San Augustine. Scott decided to keep Pillow with him for the night, but he sent Twiggs to collect troops for the demonstration. As Twiggs was uncomfortable and in pain, and had already lost himself once in the Pedregal, Lee accompanied him back toward Zacatepec. It was the third time he had made the journey that day, but there was nobody else at hand who knew enough about the road to guide Twiggs in his effort to locate those of his men who remained east of the San Angel Road. This midnight mission doubtless was undertaken on horseback, and the darkness was not so Stygian, for the worst of the storm was over and through still dripping clouds the moon now and again was visible to light the way. Slowly the general and Lee went forward until they reached Zacatepec, near which they found the headquarters of Brigadier General Franklin Pierce, senior officer in that part of the Pedregal. They told him of Scott's orders to make a demonstration in front of the entrenched camp, but as Pierce had been hurt the previous day when his horse fell, he was unable to take charge of this operation. The command devolved on Colonel T. B. Ransom of the 9th Infantry. It was now one o'clock. General Twiggs was worn out and returned to a battery position for rest, but Lee was so determined to see Scott's orders executed that he went on to Ransom's bivouac. There he explained what was required of Ransom and offered to guide the troops to what he considered the most advantageous position for a demonstration, namely, the ground occupied the previous day by the advanced American batteries. It took some time to get Pierce's wet and weary men in motion, and when they started they had to grope their way over the lava blocks. The rain had slackened. However, and ere long it ceased altogether. Day was dawning and Lee had been in the field nearly 24 hours when Ransom's men filed into the position where, on the 19th, Magruder, Collander, and Jackson had fought. The infantry were observed almost the moment they arrived, because the Mexicans were expecting a renewal of the attack from that quarter. Soon Lee found Ransom's men falling about him as they answered the fire that was being poured into them. But the action did not last very long. Between six and seven o'clock there was a nervous pause in the Mexican fire, visible confusion in the entrenched camp, and, in a few minutes, the roar of volleys from the crest of the hill above the Mexican guns. Then blue-coated men began to stream down the hillside through the growing light, and the Mexicans started to run. The attack that had been planned before Lee had left San Geronimo was being delivered from in rear of Paterna, and the Mexicans were being routed. Seventeen minutes after the first gun was fired, the whole earthwork was in the hands of the Americans, and those of the garrison who could escape were fleeing up the San Angel Road. They were joined quickly by the thousands from the plateau above the American position, for these troops, who had been much mystified by the attack, quickly caught the panic and offered no resistance. Lee went over the captured position and there found Joe Johnston, now acting as lieutenant colonel of the Voltigeur Regiment. Johnston had just heard of the death of his nephew late the previous evening and his frame, in Lee's words, was shrunk and shivered with agony. Lee held out his hand and burst into tears at the sight of his friend's grief. As soon as he could compose himself, he rode back toward San Augustine to join Scott, whom he met on the way to the scene of action. The general realized that much depended now on the speed with which the enemy was followed up. He knew as did the other commanders, that there was a crossroad north of the Pedregal. At the village of Coyoacan, this crossroad divided. The upper, or northern fork, ran to the village of Churubusco. The lower fork led from the San Angel Road to San Antonio, the advance position of the enemy on the Mexico City-Acapulco Highway. If, therefore, the United States troops could reach and hold the fork to San Antonio they would have a direct line of advance on that position from the flank and rear. General Scott had prudently anticipated this possibility and had left one brigade to mask San Antonio while ordering the rest of Worth's division to cross the Pedregal and move up the San Angel Road. As soon as he found that the enemy on the San Angel Road had been routed, Scott directed Worth to hurry back to San Augustine to advance up the Acapulco Road and to attack San Antonio from in front when Pillow and Twiggs approached it in rear, down the lower fork of the crossroad from Coyoacan. The situation around 7 a.m. was about that shown on page 268. 
As he rode steadily toward Cuyahuacan on the crossroad leading from the San Angel Road, Scott was in his glory, enjoying every moment of his triumph and giving his orders rapidly and with a quick understanding of each new development. He soon ordered Lee forward to reconnoiter the lower fork which Pillow's division was to follow in the attack on the rear of San Antonio. Before this movement could be initiated, however, word came that the enemy had hurriedly evacuated San Antonio for fear of being enveloped and was retreating up the road toward Mexico City. Meantime, a hot fire was opened from the northeast through the standing corn beyond Cuyahuacan. The enemy evidently was making a stand somewhat along the upper fork of the crossroad on the way to Churubusco. A hasty examination was made of ground about which the engineers previously had been able to learn little. It was found the Churubusco ran due east through cultivated fields, more a mill stream or a canal than a river. Where it crossed the Mexico Acapulco Road, at the village of Churubusco, a heavy bridgehead had been thrown up, with a deep wet ditch. About 450 yards to the southwest of the Tete du Pont was the convent of San Mateo, which the Americans consistently misstyled San Pablo. This enclosure covered the flank approach to the bridgehead by way of the northern fork of the crossroad and had been converted into a temporary fort with artillery and a strong garrison. To troops and officers just arriving the terrain was confusing. Some time elapsed before the United States forces understood the nature of the conventual buildings, hidden, as they were, by the head-high corn. Worth advanced up the Acapulco Road from San Antonio to Churubusco and deployed his troops across the bridgehead. Pillow joined him. The two divisions slowly but vigorously fought their way forward. Twiggs was ordered to take the convent. So confident was Scott of victory, despite the stubbornness of the Mexican resistance, that he decided to send shields north of the river, with Pearson's support, to advance eastward to the Acapulco Road and to cut off the enemy's retreat to Mexico City from the bridgehead at the village of Churubusco. Lee was instructed to lead the troops across the Churubusco and to select a position for them. Lee himself is the best narrator of what followed, discovering a large mass of infantry on the Churubusco Bridge and apprehending a fire from batteries to defend the rear, I drew out towards the city of Mexico until I reached the large hamlet, in reality the Ranch de los Pardales, on the Mexican road about three-fourths of a mile in the rear of the bridge of Churubusco. Throwing the left of his brigade upon this building which offered protection against the mass of cavalry stretching towards the gates of Mexico, and his right upon the building in the field in rear of which we had approached, General Shields formed his line obliquely to that of the enemy, who, not be outflanked, had drawn out from his entrenchments and extended his line from the bridge to nearly opposite our left. General Pierce's brigade coming up just after General Shields' brigade had commenced the attack, took position to his right, enveloping the building in the field. The general situation at this time is shown on page 270. Lee's account continued, our troops being now hotly engaged and somewhat pressed, I urged forward the howitzer battery under Lt. Reno, who very promptly brought the pieces to bear upon the head of their column with good effect. Perceiving that the enemy's cavalry were showing themselves on out left, and that our force was greatly outnumbered, I hastened back to the general-in-chief, who directed Major Sumner to take the rifle regiment and a squadron to the support of that wing. Even with this help the Mexicans could not be outflanked. The ground was too boggy and the enemy too strong. No offensive could be organized except a frontal attack on the road. Shields ordered this. Slowly the volunteers went forward in the face of very heavy fire and when they saw the Mexicans waver they charged. As they reached the road they met Worth's troops advancing up it, for the bridgehead had been taken, the convent of San Mateo had been stormed, and the victory was won. Lee joined the infantry in pressing forward. Some of the cavalry pursued to the gates of Mexico. Lee doubtless sought repose as soon as he could get it after the close of the battle. He had been on his feet or in the saddle almost continuously for thirty-six hours, had thrice crossed the Pedregal, and had been in all three of the actions, that of the 19th in the Pedregal, that of Paderna, and that of Churubusco. But he had his reward. General Twiggs wrote of him in his report of the battles, to Captain Lee, of the engineers, I have again the pleasure of tendering my thanks for the exceedingly valuable services rendered throughout the whole of these operations. More specifically, General P. F. Smith reported, in adverting to the conduct of the staff, I wish to record particularly my admiration of the conduct of Captain Lee of the Engineers.
His reconnaissances, though pushed far beyond the bounds of prudence, were conducted with so much skill that their fruits were of the utmost value, the soundness of his judgment and personal daring being equally conspicuous. Similarly, General Pillow mentioned him in this language, I cannot in justice omit to notice the valuable services of Captain Lee of the Engineer Corps, whose distinguished merit and gallantry deserves the highest praise, and who, in the execution of his duties, was ably assisted by his assistants previously mentioned. In like strain, General Shields, remembering Lee's help in the marshy field above the Rio de Churubusco, said of him, It affords me pleasure, and I but perform my duty, too, in acknowledging my great obligations to Captain R. E. Lee, Engineers Corps. And in the body of his report, describing the arrival of his forces on the field, he said, I established the right upon a point recommended by Captain Lee, Engineer Officer, in whose skill and judgment I had the utmost confidence. Noting that General Twiggs had come to his camp during the night of August 1920, General Pierce said that officer was with Captain Lee of the Engineer Corps, whose distinguished services on both days will not, I am sure, be overlooked. In short, every general under whom he served at Paterna, Contreras, and Churubusco had praise for Lee, precisely as they had at Cerro Gordo. General Scott added a final tribute when he named the officers of his staff who deserved commendation, among them Captain R. E. Lee, as distinguished for felicitous execution as for science and daring, the only officer for whom he had such words. Lee later received the brevet of Lieutenant Colonel, as of August 20, and he gained much in professional prestige. When General Scott testified in the Pillow Court of Inquiry he said that Lee's two journeys across the Pedregal on the night of August 1920 constituted the greatest feat of physical and moral courage performed by any individual, in my knowledge, pending the campaign. Lee did not glorify his own exploits. On August 22, having no time to prepare a formal report to the Bureau of Engineers, he adopted an expedient common with the general staff and wrote an informal account of the recent battles, which he addressed to Mrs. Totten, wife of his commanding officer. In this, there is no mention of any personal experience, except that of meeting Joe Johnston after the entrenched camp of Paterna had been captured.